The Don Garlitz Museum of Drag Racing. Wall-to-wall -wall mementos that capture the essence of mankind's passion for speed and competition. These are the machines and the drivers that built drag racing. Of the thousands who have played a part in the creation and evolution of the sport, only a select few are chosen for the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. And tonight, the Hall of Fame welcomes the class of 2023. Hello and welcome to the Don Garlis Museum of Drag Racing, International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. My name is Joe Costello and I'm part of the NHRA track announcing team and it is my honor to bring this program to you. Those of you who are live and also out there watching on competitionplus.com and Flow Sports, welcome. We have got one of the greatest collections of drag racing royalty ever assembled and we are going to honor some of the greats as they are inducted into the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. This room is packed, star-studded with the people who built the sport that we all love. This weekend, the Gator Nationals will be going off at Gainesville Raceway. We always take time to honor those who made the sport what it is. Over the course of the evening, we're going to hear from drag racers and broadcasters and innovators and people who broke barriers to help build drag racing. And finally, we will have someone who is known as the greatest. All of that will be coming up, but first, I would like to recap something that just went down here in the auditorium. It was an amazing occurrence as we raised money for the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame through an auction of toolboxes and artwork. And those of you out there on the stream who would like to participate and realize that this is something that just doesn't keep going by itself, but through the money raised and funds sent in by listeners and viewers and supporters of drag racing, you can reach out to the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame and donate as well. But what we would like to do is bring up a VIP and a Hall of Fame member, Ms. Pat Baltus, to the stage as we take a moment or two to recap, bringing in money, going through the live auction process, and honoring the people who have been with us Pat and Jerry Baltus have been a huge part of the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame over the years. Jerry was lost this past year, and it is with a heavy heart that we even think about the contribution he has made to drag racing. Of course, success at Indy, pioneering race cars, starting a business, and of course, ultimately, being a part of drag racing. JW, I'd like to have you come up as well. Come on up. In that, we are all a family, and we're all a community. And when any one of us goes through a difficult time, we all feel the pain. And Pat, you and Jerry have done so much over the years for this International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. It has been, uh, it has been amazing to get to know you and your family. And so each year we do something. And what we would like to do now is present you with another third toolbox. Let's bring it out, guys. Chuck Keppel from the museum. It was 2002 when Jerry was inducted into the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. The lyrics of the song that was representative of their love adorned on the top with great photographs of Jerry, top fuel racer and record holder, indie winner. Pat, this is for you. Thank you for your contribution to the sport of drag racing. You've won the but Pat Garlis you. Memorial Award. Thank, thank you so much. It has been an honor to get to know you and your family. I know they're all here. We miss Jerry as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you liked the toolbox because it's broken now. <laughs> Jerry did that. <laughs> he broke it over. <laughs> she said that was Jerry. I believe it. I believe it. All right, guys. 
We did an auction. We had a heartfelt moment. Who's ready to get this party started? When they brought me in, we said we were going to bring the energy up and we we're going to make this thing a party and we we're going to have ourselves a good time. So let's meet the very first of our inductees. Going to get the Pat Garlitz Memorial Award. Let's do it. The Pat Garlitz Award goes to a woman who is mostly behind the scenes that didn't get a lot of publicity. Linda Joan definitely fits that job. There's so much like Linda and Pat, it's unbelievable. She married Ted at 19. Pat married me at 18. We were both poor as church mouses. So were the Jones. They had nothing. And if Ted wanted to get into drag racing so bad, and they tried to buy this drag strip in Ohio, but they didn't have the money. Linda Jones went to her mother and got the down payment. Nobody knew that. All in all, they would own four drag strips before it was over. Linda, like Pat, ran all the money for the drag strip, took all the money in, was the comptroller for everything. For years and years, even when they went into the IHRA and became part of that, Linda was still running the money for IHRA. It was unbelievable. She did all the books. She designed so many different procedures that they use in drag racing today. It's unbelievable when you read the resume of Linda Jones, the things that she has done and nobody ever gave her any credit for it. I didn't even know it. My best recollection with Linda was all the work I did on the television series. She did all the paperwork and had all the book work, you know, you're gonna do this car, you're gonna do that one. And I worked with her for years and years. She's such a sweet person to work with. We just love her so much. And I know Pat is just, just has so happy right now knowing that Linda Joan is getting the Pat Garlitz Award. So please welcome Linda Jones into the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. And here's Bob and to Fry induct to Linda Jones, the voice, Mr. Bob Fry. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say when Joe said that later tonight we'll be having the greatest, nine of the presenters all thought at the same time, yep, that's my guy because we got nine great people to be honored here tonight. Um, earlier today, they took all of the presenters aside and they said, we want to tell you one thing. Try not to talk too long and drag it out. Well, let me tell you, telling an announcer not to talk too long, you'll get the same response as if you told Don Garlis there are no such things as space aliens. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll both look at you, roll our eyes, and say, you can't be serious. Now, I've been around the sport for a long while, longer than some of you in this room, but certainly not as long as most. But I have been here long enough to know a few things. I know that Pete Robinson's real first name wasn't Pete. Jungle Jim's real first name wasn't Jim, or Jungle for that matter. And Ronnie Sox's real first name was Willard. Willard Sox and Buddy Martin. Doesn't have the same ring to it. I knew Bill Grumpy Jenkins before he was Grumpy. I knew Shirley Muldowney before she was Cha-Cha. And I knew Don Garlis before he was Big Daddy. All right, well, Garlis has always been Big Daddy, but you get the idea. And I've known our Pat Garlitz Memorial Award winner when most people just knew her as Mrs. Ted Jones. To me, she was just Linda, the hardworking woman who kept the races, the IHRA national events running smoothly. There's an old saying that goes, behind every good man, there's a good woman. And if you want proof of that, just look around the room tonight. Look at myself, John Force, Jim Walther, Larry Dixon, any of the hundreds of people here in this room. Or you can look at another Hall of Fame member, Ted Jones. As Don said, when Ted was a young kid, all he wanted to do was own a drag strip. Only one thing kept him from doing that, and that was cash. Well, fortunately, he had met Linda. She wound up getting the money, and together they bought a couple of racetracks. They updated them, they upgraded them, they fixed them up, and in the course of one of their racetracks out in Muncie, Indiana, the upgrades included planting flowers in between the two lanes. Flowers that I'm sure a lot of racers in this room have mowed down more than once. <laughs> it certainly was an interesting 
uh, look. But despite all of the things at the track, all of the different layouts, the different obstacles, all the things they had overcome, all the tracks had one thing in common, and that was Linda. She took care of everything from running the pit gate to handling the money, managing the concession stands, and handling the racers' complaints. And you can guess which one of them took up most of her time. <laughs> when I first met Linda, I was just a young announcer working the IHRA races. That was the early 1970s. And whether it was at Bristol or Rockingham or Darlington, I was amazed to watch how Linda developed a system that easily kept track of the qualifying, streamlined the elimination process on Sunday, and kept it all running smoothly while keeping all those young ladies in their red outfits operating to peak efficiency. It wasn't an easy job, but Linda did it, and did it well. She caught the eye of Larry Carrier and became the CFO of IHRA and Bristol Dragway. And when she wasn't doing that, she also was the editor of Drag Review Magazine. And while Ted was working his way through the sport, carving his own niche, and becoming himself a Drag Racing Hall of Fame member, Linda turned her attention to writing the commercials for all the IHRA national events. And while Linda didn't go, Sunday, Sunday, she did make enough commercials to receive an Addy Award as the best commercials in the sport of drag racing. And after mastering all of those jobs, she then became CFO of Masters Entertainment. And by the way, I should point out that Masters Entertainment is taping the show tonight. It's Linda's organization, so if the Pat Garlitz Award gets a lot of time on the TV show, you'll know why. <laughs> well, after seeing how she managed the IHRA and the national events, it didn't surprise me that Linda would have such a great impact on the sport of drag racing. Other than tune and drive a race car, and I'm not sure that she didn't do that also, there wasn't much that she hadn't done in the sport. And all the while, a lot of people, including a lot of the people in this room, knew her simply as Mrs. Ted Jones. But those of us who knew her and worked with her and saw her in action knew that she was so much more than that. She was a moving force in many phases of the sport, now, it's said that Linda has a genius IQ, but let me tell you, the fact that Ted Jones married her makes me think Ted might be the genius in that family because he really came out on the better end of it. I said earlier that behind every good man there was a good woman, but let me tell you, Linda was never behind anything. She was out in front of the sport. She pioneered a lot of the inroads in the sport of drag racing and became a legend. The Pat Garlitz Memorial Award is one of the most prestigious awards that can be given out by the Hall of Fame. Previous winners included people with the name of Baltus, Glidden, and Prudhomme. And now we're all glad to add another name, the name of one of the hardest working and most well-respected women in the sport, Mrs. Linda Jones, or as I call her simply, Linda. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the 2023 Pat Garlitz Memorial Award winner as her family calls her, Miss Pris, Linda Jones. <laughs> Linda's in the back of the room. She's had some health problems. Can't make it up to the stage, so we're going to take her trophy to her. Joe? Thank you, Bob, here with Linda Jones. Linda, congratulations. You are the Pat Garlitz Memorial Award winner. I am so proud to be the recipient of the Pat Garlitz Award. She was quite a woman. She raised her kids going to the races. She made time for piano lessons and the whole nine yards, but she was quite a woman, and I really respect her. Now, as far as following in her footsteps, I took a different path as far as doing books and numbers and things like that, but she was quite a lady, and I never heard her say anything bad about anyone. Now, <clears throat> you saw earlier a picture of four or five girls that worked for me in the tower, and they did quite a job. There were five of us actually, that did all the stats and everything back when it was on paper and typewriter. So we had a fun time, we had a great time, and we enjoyed it. 
and one of the ladies is here tonight. She actually still works in the tower at Bristol, and her husband uh, gets the kids lined up for junior dragster. But there's one thing you got coming down the road. My granddaughter likes drag racing, so <laughs> everybody look out. She won. She won Junior Street this year, and she's a force to be reckoned with. So I'm really proud that I've won this award and see all the work that I've done over the years come to fruition. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, flanked by her family, Judge Linda Fay, Holly Vining, Ted Jones, your Pat Garlitz Memorial Award winner, Linda Jones. And we will be back with more from the International Drag Racing and Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Coming up next, Ron Atterbury and Shelly Anderson Payne will be inducted into the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame, class of 2023. And none of this would happen without our great sponsors. Special thanks to Masters Entertainment Group, has been a sponsor since 2001 and is running our live stream as we speak. Earwood Racing Consultants since 2003. Steve has got a new project, the Racing Consultants Biz, and you know he can get the job done after all those years of promoting drag strips around the country. Congratulations for what you have done. And the folks at SEMA, welcome back. Since 2006, the Specialty Equipment Manufacturers Association, a supporter of Don Garlitz Museum of Drag Racing, International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. Welcome and thank you to all. Improve the look of your car with Lightspeed Racing Wheels. Forged magnesium, aluminum, and carbon fiber, Lightspeed Racing Wheels are stronger, corrosion resistant, and lighter. Improving performance, braking, acceleration, and fuel economy. With almost endless customization options, each wheel is custom made to order. For race or street, get the wheel that perfectly fits your needs. Lightspeed Racing, ultra lightweight wheels. We are, we are now back. Welcome back to the Don Garlis Museum of Drag Racing, International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. We're going to keep on going. But for those of you who have been coming year after year, you know that once the Hall of Fame is gone, you need something to remember it by. And each year, Roy Hill does a great job of sponsoring our shot glasses out there. And the collectible shot glasses are once again, excuse me, they're scotch glasses, available again this year. And so if you got a ticket, don't forget to pick up your glasses at the end uh, just outside of the hall. But if you, you want more than one, those are certainly available for purchase as well. So do not forget. And also, while we are here, we want to take time to recognize all the members of the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame that are currently here in attendance this amazing sold-out year. So when I say your name, we'd love you to stand up and be seen on the folks on CBS Sports and, of course, Flow Sports and Competition Plus, starting out with Mr. Steve Gibbs. Steve, where are you out there? Steve, a 30-year Board of Selectors member. Steve, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And also a proud, proud papa, I'm sure, Mr. Brad Anderson. Brad, where are you? Bad Brad. Excellent. He's going to be real proud here moments from now. How about another, or two actually, but another Pat Garlitz Memorial Award winner, Lori Force. Lori, there she is. Thank you very much, Lori. Another Pat Garlis Memorial Award winner, Pat Baltus. We just saw Pat up here. I'm sure she's have. Thank you, Pat. And she's got Jerry. Look at that. Hold that up for TV. That is amazing. Jim Walder just got a mention. Where are you, Jim? Jim, there he is. Jim, thank you very much. Jim was hanging with us at our NHRA press conference a little bit earlier, I believe. Thank you very much, Jim. And of course, Big Daddy himself, Don Garlitz. Don was working the crowd last night down at Bernie's Speed Shop. It was amazing. Dennis Holding, where are you, Dennis? Dennis is out there. There's Gar. Dennis, where's Dennis? Dennis Holding is out there, of course. Do I want to see Dennis? Dave Yahara, you in the house? Where's Dave? 
we were worried, uh, we were told that Dave would be here. Maybe he's out, right? Like, I'm going to go get a beer. And then we call your name, Jack Doyle. Jack Doyle had a lot to do at New England Dragway. We're going to be heading up that way. Jack Doyle in the house. Bruce Larson in the house. There's Jack. There's Dave. There's Bruce. Ray Moles. Ray's your birthday? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Now, we're not going to sing happy birthday to you, but you understand. You don't want to get embarrassed. Steve Earwood. Steve, who has gone into the consulting business. Way to go, Steve. Appreciate it. Another Pat Garlitz Memorial Award winner, Laura South. Steve and Laura sitting together, of course. Laura, where are you? Thank you, Laura. She's over there. Shirley. Where's Shirley Muldowney? I saw Shirley earlier. Stand up, Shirley. Shirley Muldowney. The yin to garlic's yang. Amazing stuff. Dave Bartman. Where's Dave? There he is. He was ready. He's ready. Way to go, Dave. Thank you very much. Hall of Famers in the house coming back year after year to support this. Roy Hill. Roy in the house? Where's Roy? No Roy. Mike Lewis is in the house. First of all, I want to say Roy Hill. Roy Hill, Mike, thank you very much. Hall of Famer, Mike Lewis. Roy Hill was back at a drag strip for the first time in several years earlier this year at Orlando Speed World, and I was out there, saw Roy. He was doing great. It was so great to see him. Thank you, Roy, if you're out there on the stream. Fred Miller. Where's Fred? Waterbed Fred. Where are you? There you go. And Tim Richards. Tim was just inducted. Tim Richards in the house, Hall of Famers. And now this next row, all together. They just created the biggest party Daytona has ever happened. Uh, and I'm talking about the Gwynn family. Jerry Gwynn, stand up. Joan Gwynn, stand up, Joan. Pat Garlitz Memorial Award winner. Is DG still around? Daryl? Daryl Gwynn. There he is, Daryl Gwynn. Multiple halls of fame for Daryl Gwynn. DG, you did such a great job the other night. All of us Miami Hollywood Speedway alumni, like, we had a tear. That was amazing. Daryl Gwynn, guys, the Gwynn family. And Ted Jones. Ted, stand up. Ted is in the lights. Ted, thank you for all you've done for the sport of drag racing in multiple halls as well. But Ted Jones is such a hard worker. He loves the sport of drag racing more than anybody that I know. To all of our Hall of Famers, thank you, thank you, thank you. But now it's time for our next inductee. Let's go back to the video and our host, Mr. Big Daddy, Don Garlitz. You know, Shirley Muldowney paved the way for women drag racers and following in her footsteps was Shelly Anderson, Later, she would get married and be known as Shelly Anderson Payne. She won her first race in Top Alcohol in 1991, a U.S. Nationals event. And then she went on to Top Fuel in 1996, had a great season, winning six events in Top Fuel in NHRA. Then in 2000, she moved into Pro Mod, had a great career in Pro Mod, but in 2005, she had two major accidents, and it almost got her out of drag racing. But by 2006, she was back into racing and on with her career. So Shelly Anderson stands out as a really good inductee into the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame because she has done a lot for drag racing and a lot of good publicity out of that young lady. And here's Bob Fry to make the presentation. We are working Bob Fry very hard tonight. Welcome back, Bob. Hold your applause. Uh, is there any chance I could get a little more light overhead, please? Not, not on my bald spot, but on the podium. Is there any chance I just? I will take that as a no. <laughs> so, let me just begin by saying what an honor it is to be here tonight. And, and first of all, I didn't know that, I, that my two um, inductees were going to be back to back. But I have to tell you, and I mean this in my heart, that to be asked by people the quality of Linda Jones, of Shelly Anderson to be the ones to induct them in the Hall of Fame is really something special, and I thank them very much for that. 
I'd also like to say that it's a, a great night to be here with the Hall of Fame. It really is like a who's who of the sport of drag racing. And of course, we want to say a special thanks to our host, Big Daddy Don Garlitz, for uh, continuing this great tradition, maintaining it, and making it one of the great uh, highlights of the drag racing year. You know, tonight's a very special reason, not the least of which is the fact that we are honoring three very talented women here tonight. Three women who have all helped make the sport of drag racing the special and unique thing that it is. You look around at NASCAR and Indy racing, and they struggle to have a woman qualify for a race, let alone win a race. And here we are tonight as drag racers, honoring and inducting three women into the Hall of Fame. In my mind, that's what makes drag racing and the people here tonight so very special. You know, a lot of kids grow up wondering what they're going to be when they get older. But as far as my next inductee is concerned, Shelley Anderson, I guess you could say that what she would do and the unique person she would become and the place she would occupy in the sport of drag racing was pretty much preordained. I mean, let's face it, when your DAD runs BAE, it's almost a guarantee you're going to be driving a CAR. <laughs> in other words, when Brad Anderson's your father, and he himself was a member of the Drag Racing Hall of Fame, you probably know your daughter's not growing up to play field hockey. She's going to do something in racing. And Shelly did more than just something in racing. She excelled in the sport and exceeded its highest level in top fuel dragsters. Shelly, like the great Shirley Muldowney, never wanted to be looked at as a woman racer. She just wanted to be known as a drag racer. And she was a good one, one of the best. After a brief stint in top alcohol dragster, Shelly turned around and set her sights on top fuel, and she took the class by storm. Only three women have ever set the NHRA national top fuel record, and Shelly was the first one to do it, and she did it three times. And as a little aside, that's when you actually had to back up the record to get it. That made it even more special. Over the course of her career, Shelly drove hard and competed with the best in the sport. But she did more than that. I remember talking to Cheryl Limwell Downey one day, and she told me that of all the women that are racing and drag racing, she really admired Shelly Anderson because Shelly could do everything with the car and not just drive it. She knew how to work on the engine. She knew how it operated. She knew what made it run and what didn't. In between rounds, she wasn't out there signing autographs, although she was in great demand, but she was working on the car. I'll never forget one time I was in the pit area with Shelly, and they were working on the car in Pomona. She was kind of thrashing around, and she finally looked over at me, and she said, Bob, hand me the speed wrench. <laughs> well, those of you that know me know I know squat about mechanics, <laughs> and I figured there had to be somebody else named Bob in the pit area. <laughs> finally, Shelly, sweating, looked over and said, Bob, it's that big shiny silver thing over there. And I said, great. Handed her the speed wrench, and she went on and won the race at Pomona that year. And I like to think that I played a big part in that success. <laughs> uh, by the way, Shelly went on to win a whole lot of other races that I had nothing to do about, but we're going to cut that out because of time. <laughs> but it wasn't all roses for Shelly. In 1996, 10 years after Big Daddy had his classic blowover at Englishtown, Shelley had one of her own at Brandon, Minnesota. And after watching it, the car was demolished, and most people thought that Shelley and the team were done for the weekend. But those people underestimated Shelley Anderson and her determination and her passion. And being the hardcore racer that he is, she is, she stayed with the team until 3 o'clock in the morning. They put a new car together, came out the next day, and qualified for the race. And that's the kind of thing that, in my mind, separates a driver from a racer. And make no mistake about it, Shelly Anderson is a great racer. And tonight, she's a Hall of Fame racer. While Shelly might shy away from the, name, the words like pioneer and inspiration, she certainly is and has been both. When she won her first top fuel race, she became just the fourth woman in NHRA history to accomplish that. And since that day, I'm sure that she has been an inspiration to many young men, men and women who know that if you work hard and determine, you can succeed in just about anything. From the days working with her father, Brad, to the love she has from her mother, Carol, and her sister, Leanne, 
to the days that she shared with her, the winter circle with her brother Randy, to all the time she has spent at the track with her husband Jay, who himself should be a Hall of Famer, to the time that she spends now with her son and daughter, Toby and Madison, and watching them win, Shelly Anderson epitomizes what it means to be a drag racer. She comes from a great drag racing family, and today she enters and becomes part of another great drag racing family. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to say, let's welcome the latest inductee into the 2023 Drag Racing Hall of Fame, Shelly Anderson. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, I played field hockey, Bob. <laughs> um, my DAD didn't want me to drive a CAR. Um, he made me do everything three times as long as any other employee, because go to college and get a real job. And then he put obstacles in my way. He said, you got to graduate college, you got to find a sponsor, and that I'm not paying for it. And it was pretty cool. Um, he had Jolly Rancher, so did John, Joe DiLeonardo. And Joe saw me working and working and working and trying. And he came and he said, I want to put you in a car, a top fuel car. And I said, no, thank you. I want an alcohol car. That's what I work on. That's what I know. That's who we are. And Joe said, okay. So uh, we went to my first national event in 91 at Denver and qualified. And we went to Indy that year, like five races later, and Joe said, you're getting a top fuel car. Well, I was kind of startled, but my dad and Joe did it all, and they worked it out. But it was great, it was really nice. Now I wanna go fast forward to a Friday, I think in December, my phone rings and it says unknown caller and I don't usually answer them. And I answered it and it was Don Gartless. Well, it said caller I, I, unknown, I mean, I don't have you on my phone, so I, I answered it and I was like, I, I, I really was shocked. I will never, ever erase recent phone calls. You are that guy. <laughs> and that, I'm serious, that's how much it really means to me. It's, it's wow. I will always remember this moment. This, this is very important to us. I, I thank you. Um, when we started racing, I grew up in it. And I'm kind of off topic, but I remember we were at Pomona and it rained out on a Sunday my dad was racing. We had to go to school Monday. And he said, I don't have time to take you to school. You guys are going to the racetrack. <laughs> I mean, racing's first. So my mom, of course, had to go to work. So my dad made us go to the racetrack on that Monday, not go to school. And we were in the pits, and they called him to the lanes. And I don't know if you remember this. They called him to the lanes, and he said, go to the stands. I'll come get you. So OK, we went to the stands, and my brother and my sister and I are sitting there freezing. Nothing's going down the track, and it started snowing. And I, looked, I go, let's go back. And my sister said, no, Dad said he'd come get us. Do you remember this? Yeah, exactly. We go back to the pits like 10 minutes later, and he forgot he brought us to the track. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how that went. Well, between my dad, who won three championships, my husband, who won two championships, and my brother who won two. This is our passion. This is just what we do. We are racers, and we absolutely love it. Now, we get to share our passion with the third generation. Madison and Toby race. They've had success in the NHRA and both won. Toby won a week and a half ago. He went seven rounds, won, beat his sister fifth, but she left on him. Let's be honest, um, and we love it. Dwayne Shields lets her drive his car in the A Fuel, and they won two races last year, and hopefully many more this year. Well, racing with us is a passion. It's a drive, and it's where we found the rest of our family. 
We have some great friends here. They are family. Sally, Buggy Parker, Cowboy, Mike Urick, Larry Dixon, Steve, oh boy, Steve, and Dwayne Shields. And we're very lucky to be here. Um, we started with Jolly Rancher, Alcohol Dragster. I got to win uh, Atlanta. I beat my husband. We were dating. Um, second round. That was fun. <laughs> Sorry. And then uh, we won. Um, then we beat Daryl Russell and then Blaine Johnson. So that, that was nice. And then we started a year later to that date at Denver in the top fuel car. And uh, when we won Seattle with my brother in his alcohol funny car, that was really special. That was, that was a good race. Then I got to go on and work for ESPN. John Mullins hired me in 99, and I loved that for two and a half years until I uh, had Madison, I, I left. But in between that, my dad came, and he's like, hey, I got this pro mod, you wanna drive it? <laughs> well, yeah, you're gonna drive anything that's offered. And I go, yeah. Well, I was pregnant. Jay knew I was pregnant, but nobody else did. But I wanted to get my license. I wanted to secure this ride. So we went to Vegas, I got the ride, I got my license, and we're driving home, and Jay's like, how are you gonna tell your dad? And I go, tomorrow. So we went, went to work the next day, and I said, Dad, having a baby, I gotta step aside, but I wanna drive it. So he let Jay drive it, and we had two kids, and then he built two cars for Jay and I both and we had some good times. We raced a couple of times. I won Dallas with my kids. That was just so special. A lot of people don't get to race with their, you know, having their kids there. My husband wins a lot with our kids. That was the only race I ever won, and it was so special to have them there. I think that's my favorite because it was such a, it was all family, my dad, all of us. And uh, a lot of people have a guest house or a vacation home. And my husband keeps telling me how many beach houses he's bought with our racing. <laughs> and our guess our beach house is on axles and wheels, and it goes to all the races. And uh, I think we're lucky. I think I'd much rather have that and have our family and our friends than be anywhere else. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. More to come from the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame induction ceremony. More legends, including a chassis builder who started out at just five years old and would build championship chassis for some of the greatest, Ron Atterbury. And it's all possible thanks to our great sponsors, including Gainesville Raceway, a big event happening this weekend out there at Gainesville Raceway, by the way. Thank you, Gainesville, for all you've done. Such a great facility, timeless, and now the start of the 2023 NHRA Camping World season. Thank you, Gainesville Raceway. And Hankstifers, metalworking lubricants, been on board since 2019. Welcome and thank you, Hankstifers. Thank you for your support of the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. And since 2016, Mr. Ron Hope has been a supporter of the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. Ron, thank you for your support. More to come here in Gainesville. When your next adventure is calling, be ready with Gobi Roof Racks. Fully customizable and handmade in the USA. Gobi Racks define what a utility rack should not only look like, but also how it should perform. Created with the adventurer in mind, Gobi Racks will easily carry your most demanding cargo for the life of your vehicle, and it will look great doing it. All seasons, all adventures. Start your dream today with Gobi Roof Racks. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a moment to honor those members who have passed. That doesn't mean 
he wouldn't like to raise. I grew up on a farm, and look what I did. At five years of age, his mother found him out in the barn taking panels off the tractor. What are you doing, Ron? I'm making it lighter so it'll go faster. It was in his blood. By 20, he was racing his own cars, and then he, in 1975, he won a big race at Bakersfield, but his real thing in drag racing was his chassis. His first chassis was sold to Frank Bradley, who won the 1976 NHRA Winter Nationals, and that kick-started him off. Gary Beck had his cars, James Warrens had his cars, Baca had his cars, but the person who bought the car that made him famous was Shirley Muldowney. He built her first car in 1976 and went on to build them through 1980. This is the 1980 car that was in heart like a wheel. And forever, Ron Atterbury will be enshrined in drag racing for building that car. She won the world championships with it and went on to become, oh, you know, just famous, famous, famous. But Ron Atterbury is certainly deserving to be in the Hall of Fame, and we welcome him tonight into the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. And here's Jim Waringen to make the presentation. Hi. My name is Jim Waringen. I'm nervous as hell, so <laughs> bear with me. I'm very proud to call Ryan Edbury my friend for almost 60 years. I'm actually the one that introduced Ronnie and his wife Robin 50 years ago, but over the years she's forgiven me. <laughs> Ronnie started racing as a lot of kids did in go-karts, and he was good at it and he enjoyed it. And after he went to the first drag race with his brother-in-law, Jack Costella. And after watching and helping Jack for a while, Ronnie decided he wanted to go drag racing. So at age 20, he and his brother Raymond built a top gas car. And they raced top gas mostly in California until NHRA dissolved the class in 1971. He then decided to go top fuel racing. And after helping his good friend and fellow inductee, Dave Yahara, build his first rear engine car, Ronnie designed and built his own car. The car was it caught a lot of people's attention, and Frank Bradley uh, conned him into building him a car and became his first paying customer. Ronnie went on to build cars for Shirley Muldowney, Gary Beck, uh, Jeb Allen, Warren Colbert and Miller, Tommy Ivo, uh, Gary Ritter, Dennis Baca, the list goes on. His cars worked really well. Shirley won her first two championships in his cars, and Gary Beck and Jeb Allen also won championships in his cars. Ronnie continued to race his own car while he was building other cars, and he <laughs> raced mostly in California with a couple of trips back east, but in, in 1977, his long-time friend Jim Lieberman talked Ronnie into coming back east and racing with him. And he raced, he match raced up and down the east coast with the Jungle Jim logo on the Atterbury Brothers car. And after a year or so on the road, he decided it was time to go back home. And they packed up and moved back to California. The first car he built when he got back to California was Tommy Ivo's jet car. Ronnie then made the transition from dragsters to hot rods and he opened Atterbury Street Rods. And he used the same craftsmanship and attention to detail in his race cars. He built a whole string of award-winning street rods. In the 1980s, two of his customers and good friends, Brian Burnett and Tom Prufer, started the Nostalgia Drag Race program. And after holding himself back for several years, he decided it was time to go racing again. So he built himself an A-fuel car with a Brad Anderson motor and went drag racing again. And that car too worked very well and he won the A-fuel championship in 2003. For his last racing endeavor, he decided to go salt flat racing and he built a rear engine modified roadster and it put him in the 200 mile an hour club at Bonneville. 
Ronnie continued to build street rods until health issues forced him to retire in 2019. Although ASR is still run very successfully today by his son-in-law, Matt Dowd. Ronnie was also a mentor to many of us in this room. He, he's the one that taught me how to weld. And he mentored Mike Terry while they were building dragsters. And he worked side by side with his, with his son-in-law, Matt, building street rods for over 20 years. Ronnie now enjoys his retirement in the mountains of Northern California. And he's also very much of a family man. And his family's here with him tonight, his wife Robin, his daughter Mandy, his son-in-law Matt, and three wonderful grandkids, Baron, Elise, and Avery. Actually, Baron's fired up my cackle car a few times, so we might get him dragged into this whole thing. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge Robin and thank her for 50 years of love and support and helping Ronnie to achieve his dreams. And I'd like to say something now for his family and all the friends that are here tonight. Is Ronnie, we're very proud of you, and we love you. And I would like to introduce the newest member of the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame, Ron Atterbury. forgot me. <laughs> You're hard to forget. I know. <laughs> no, I appreciate it, really. It's, it's my dream, and I filled it. So I kind of backed off a little bit and get some other things done. But at least we got some records. You did? Yes. <laughs> appreciate it. Still to come here at the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame, an inductee who left an indelible mark on the sport of drag racing, Carol Bunny Burkett, and of course, the 16-time champ, John Force, lies ahead. But first, we always want to thank those who support the Hall of Fame endeavors, including Roy Hills Drag Racing School. Since 2004, Roy has been such a great sponsor. Roy, so helpful, and we are so happy to see you back. Roy Hills Drag Racing School and Capco Contractors. On board this year, Capco has changed the sport of drag racing for the better. They're in the house, them Capco boys. Thank you, Capco. And Summit Racing Equipment. Since 2002, Summit Racing Equipment, such a huge supporter, NHRA Drag Racing, and Grassroots Drag Racing at all levels. Thank you, Summit. Improve the look of your car with light speed racing wheels. Forged magnesium, aluminum, and carbon fiber, light speed racing wheels are stronger, corrosion resistant, and lighter. Improving performance, braking, acceleration, and fuel economy. With almost endless customization options, each wheel is custom made to order. For race or street, get the wheel that perfectly fits your needs. Light speed racing, ultra lightweight wheels. We just keep on moving here at the Big Daddy Don Garlitz Museum of Drag Racing, International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. Let's find out from the man, Big Daddy, who our next inductee is. You know, drag racers come from all walks of life, and no better example of that than Bunny Burkett. She was the Playboy Bunny at the Baltimore Playboy Club, a very beautiful young lady. She got interested in drag racing in the mid-60s. Her husband bought her a 1964 Mustang and the bug was bitten. She drove top alcohol dragsters for many years, 
had a very bad crash in 1995 and would have put most people out of business, but she continued racing. She won the 1986 IHRA World Championship and the 1986 Keystone National Alcohol Funny Championship. She had a bad bout with cancer, but she continued to race clear into 2015, a very great representative of drag racing, and we welcome her into the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. Here to present Bunny is Royce Miller. Good evening, everyone. Wow, I'm going to tell you what, get in a room like this, you kind of feel a little young. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to be here tonight to acknowledge this Hall of Fame recognition on behalf of Carol Bunny Burkett. Bunny Baquette will long be remembered as a fan favorite competitor among alcohol funny car racers, having a celebrated career that spanned 55 years and touched many lives along the way. Born Carolyn Ruth Hartman in West Virginia in 1945, her signature nickname Bunny was the result of a short-lived hostess job at a Playboy Club in Baltimore, Maryland, and while she kept the job for less than a year, the moniker of Bunny stayed with her. Bunny's introduction to the drag racing came from a young man who famously told her that girls can't drive. She would later marry that same young man Marion Oliver Burkett, known to his friends as Mo, who was among the youngest workers on a construction team that was building Washington Dulles Airport. On their very first date, Mo took Bunny to Old Dominion Speedway in Manassas, Virginia, and her life was changed forever. Bunny was instantly fascinated with the sport of drag racing and stated her desire to give it a try, prompting the now famous line from Mo about girls not being able to drive. Well, since Bunny, in fact, could not yet drive, she persuaded Mo to teach her. So evening after evening, Mo would take her to the very airport that he was helping build and taught his future wife to drive on the runways of the Dulles Airport while it was still under construction. They were married a short time later. Bunny was 16 years old. From the very beginning, she was a fan-friendly racer who also got along well with the other competitors. Mo and Benny were also busy raising their daughters, Sherry and Julie. When the 1970s rolled around, Bunny was becoming an even more diehard racer, competing in a number of categories, including B stock automatic, super stock, super gas, and even pro stock. The desire to go faster was always at the forefront of her racing career, so the move to Alcohol Funny Car transformed her into the beloved match racing star that we come to love. Despite a modest budget throughout her racing career, she was the first woman ever to win both IHRA and NHRA national events in Alcohol Funny Car, and the 1986 was crowned the IHRA world champion the same year. She won the, also won the NHRA Division II championship. Bunny's win at the 1986 NHRA Keystone Nationals was especially significant. It was the first time a woman had won in this challenging category. While women have made significant inroads into many other drag racing categories, Bunny's achievement stood for 25 years, 
It was not until 2011 that Alexis DeJoria become the second woman to win an NHRA Top Alcohol Funny Car National Event. Bunny, was the, Bunny has even ris, raced in Top Fuel. Bunny traveled to Germany in, tw in 2001 and competed in Donnie Holbrook's Top Fuel car with solid 520s at 270 miles per hour. Despite Bunny's successes, her career has been far from easy. In September 1995, Bunny experienced a nearly fatal accident while match racing. She was forced off the track at over 200 miles per hour and traveled through a ditch and into the woods. She spent three weeks in a coma after the crash, which led, well, left her with two broken legs, two fractured vertebrae, a fractured wrist. Bunny was in intensive care for a week. According to doctors, she had little hope of walking again and no hope of returning to racing or driving. During the interview, Bunny said, I died that day three times. Once in the stretcher on the, uh, and twice more in the helicopter on the way to the trauma center. But they were able to bring me back each time. However, Bunny's determination, competitive spirit, led to the remarkable recovery and her return to competition. As challenging as the crash and recovery was, Bunny also fought two bouts of cancer. She continued driving until 2015 when she turned over the wheel to her boys. One of Bunny's unique contribution to MIR is a special one indeed. Her world championship winning funny car is proudly displayed on the roof of MIR's Hot Rods Diner. Bunny donated this historic car to be proudly displayed for fans to enjoy. On April 4th, 2020, she went to bed at her home in Spotsylvania, Virginia, and woke up in heaven. As she passed away peacefully in her sleep, she was 74 years old. A celebration of life fundraiser for the family was held for Bunny at the 2021 Superchargers Showdown at MIR. This heartfelt tribute to Bunny included a full house of racers and fans, including over 20 supercharged funny cars, alters, and dragsters, that all donated their runs for Bunny and the family. At the end of the second round of that tribute, both of Bunny, Bunny Funny Cars were brought to the starting line. Gary Pritchett, Bunny's godson, was driving one. And in the parachute of both cars were the ashes of Bunny Burkett. Bunny's last wishes were the ashes be spread to the top end of MIR. And that's precisely what happened on that run. It was a moving tribute to Bunny and one that saw many tears in fans' eyes. On a personal note, in the over 30 years I've been at the helm of MIR, I have worked with the best drivers and personalities in the sport. But no one has ever been more dedicated to the fans than Bunny was. I can't tell you how many times on a large event when she was there that after the race was over, the purses were paid, the traffic was out, and it was time to turn out the lights and go home, that I would look over to see Bunny still talking with her fans, signing autographs, taking photos, and would not leave until the very last fan had their moment with her. I will truly miss Bunny and the chats and laughs we had along the way. In conclusion, I would say that Bunny Burkett is a true legend of drag racing. She has made an indelible impact on the sport and has earned this place in the International Hot Rod Drag Racing Hall of Fame. I am eternally grateful for her friendship and partnership over the years, and I am proud to invite Bunny's godson, Gary Pritchett, a.k.a. Little Bear, to accept this honor on Bunny's behalf. Thanks, Roy. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Royce, for the heartfelt introduction and for your unwavering support of Bunny throughout her career. How awesome is 
is it that I get to accept this award on Bunny Burkett's behalf and to be honored at the same time as these other great contributors to the sport is nothing short of amazing. I wish Bunny could have been here, but I know she's smiling down from heaven. Hello everyone, I'm Gary Pritchett and Bunny is my godmother. <laughs> you guys make this look easy up here, Bob Fry. This is, this is hard. <laughs> My dad and I joined the Burkett family in 1987 when I was 18 months old, and that day set the stage for my career in drag racing. Because of Bunny and Mo, I'm a drag racing professional today. For that, I am forever grateful. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the man behind the scenes of Bunny's career. Mo Burkett, will you stand? Hey, Mo, girls can drive. <laughs> On behalf of Bunny, I would like to dedicate this award to Mo, my late father, Bear, the boys, which there's three of them in here that work on teams still right now, one John Boyce with Capco, Adam and Aaron Cave, they're on the Scrappers racing team, <clears throat> and we're all out here because of Bunny and Mo, and the girls and her many, many fans. We all miss Bunny and will carry on her legacy by making a few appearances a year with the funny car. And uh, thank you again for this incredible honor. Coming up here at the 2023 International Drag Racing Hall of Fame induction ceremony, Sonny Messner and Graham Cowan, both enter the hall and we'd like to take this time to thank more of our sponsors including the national hot rod association the nhra for so many years supporters of the international drag racing hall of fame of course the gator nationals the kickoff to the 2023 season we wish you all a great event and National Parts Depot, since 2004, a supporter of the Don Garlitz Museum of Drag Racing International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. And if you walk that Hall of Fame, you'll notice the name WINS on many of the cars. Since 2022, the folks at WINS are back. Thank you and welcome to WINS. Thank you for your support of the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. At Eagle Lights, we're off-road and motorsport enthusiasts at heart and one of the largest aftermarket LED headlight manufacturers in the world. Manufacturing the highest quality LED headlights and motorcycle lights possible. At EagleLights.com, you can find the right size lights with the right connectors the first time without guessing. So you can buy and use Eagle Lights with confidence. Eagle Lights, finely crafted LED lighting solutions. See and be seen. Welcome back to the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Are you guys having a good time tonight? I am. I am as well. I'm loving this, having so much fun. You know, the whole history of drag racing, though, what would it be, where would it be without the people who capture the moments, the behind-the-scenes person that maybe they don't want to drive a race car and maybe they just want to be a part of it, but they are working very hard behind the scenes. And so I would like to talk about someone who has done exactly that. In fact, without this person, so much of the history of the sport of drag racing would not have have been documented. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage someone who has been there since the very beginning, and frankly, he says he just got lucky to be there, but he has done a whole lot more. Mr. Richard Shoot. Richard, come on up from Auto Imagery. Richard is doing the Hall of Fame tours nowadays. He's claiming he's retiring, but we know that he loves this stuff too much. Uh, Richard, your contribution to the sport of drag racing is tremendous. I know Chuck and the folks at the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame wanted to make sure that you know that you are loved and appreciated. I believe we have a plaque that we are going to present to Richard. You've done a lot of these tours since you've stopped full-time, but I know you've been out there from the very beginning, OCIR and others, but without your contribution to the sport of drag racing, so many in the next generation would not know what it was and what it was like. 
Richard, on behalf of the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame, we would like to present you this plaque to thank you and commemorate your contribution to the sport of NHRA drag racing. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Shute. Thank you, Richard. Wow, I mean, this is just beyond any comprehension that I could have. Um, I love what I do. I've, I've, I fell in love with drag racing in the mid 60s and I found a way to be able to do it and get out there and have the best seat in the house. And I never knew that that would last for 50 plus years the memories, the people, all of the stuff that I've been able to witness is just amazing. And to have these memories that I've captured on film and digitally, and tonight to receive something like this is beyond belief. Um, I wanna thank Don Garlitz and, and Chuck and everybody in this room for the recognition that you've awarded me. Um, it's beyond belief. I thank you very, very much. Um, I don't know what else to say other than thank you, and I'm very graciously appreciative of every one of you here. Thank you. Autoimagery.com has been capturing the sport of drag racing on film for many decades. Richard, thank you. You deserve it. Everybody wants a collectible, whether it be a photograph, a very cool scotch class, or a t-shirt. What would drag racing be without t-shirts? We got t-shirts in the house here tonight, guys. Beautiful t-shirts after it's all over. When you exit the hall, you can turn to your right and check out the shirts if you would like a commemorative t-shirt of this event. The artwork is unbelievable, and you're going to want to commemorate this historic event here the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. All right, it's time to roll on. We're going to keep this show moving. We're going to throw it back to our host up on the screen, Big Daddy, Don Garlitz. Graham Cowan is our next inductee, and he is from Australia. In 1973, him and his wife took everything they owned and invested it in a nitro fuel dragster. That got him into drag racing, and he loved top fuel. 1985, he came to the United States and he competed for two years in the NHRA circuit, was the runner-up at the 1987 Winter Nationals in Pomona. Then he went back to Australia in 1993 and he drove an Australian top fuel car, became the first man in the five-second bracket. In 1995, he won the Australian Top Fuel Championship. That was quite remarkable. Then he put this Nitro series together, he called it the Outlaw Series, and this series became so popular, they put the New Zealand racers and the Australian racers together. He was a very popular guy down in Australia, and then he opened his own business, Rocket Industries, and he's there just today, one of the finest businessmen in Australia. Please welcome Graham Colvin to the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. Here's Morris McMillan to make the presentation. Uh, firstly, it's such an honour to stand up here and accept this award for Graham. Um, some people know him as the Aussie Raider, some know him as the Rocker Man, but we all know him as GC. Um, I managed to speak to Bob Fry before about what you get up here and say. Problem was, I was too excited to meet Bob Fry, I forgot to listen. <laughs> what I want to start with is, a, is GC's wife, Wendy. Um, this, is not, this is not an award for GC, it's an award for him and his wife. Most people talk about the wives, you know, pulling the purse strings, holding the money. Well, if you look at GC's shed with 12 nitro cars in it, I don't think uh, she's doing too much of a good job on that. Now, GC started as just a truck driver um, with a passion for drag racing. Him and his wife, Wendy, as you saw, built, built Psycho, and um, to this day, he still sees himself just as that truck driver from West Sydney. The, the, the morning that uh, Big Daddy called, he. Uh, he rings me up and says, Morris, listen to this, listen to this. And he plays me this voicemail from Big Daddy. He didn't even listen to the fact that he'd made the Hall of Fame. He was just that excited that Big Daddy had called him. <laughs> but that, to me, really just showed that the racer that Graham is, and it, 
you know, he doesn't do this for the accolades, it's just about racing. Some of his biggest achievements came, without a doubt, here in the US. Um, for him, challenging, challenging himself against the greatest is, you know, that was the biggest challenge and that's, that's what he wanted to do in racing. And, you know, 1985, he runner-up in Pomona in Funny Car and then I think it was 99 with his son Andrew behind the wheel at, uh, at Indy was a runner-up as well. So, um, yeah, he was just really proud to come and represent his country and race against the best in the world. One of the big things about GC is not just his racing, but what he does for the sport. Um, every racetrack, every series, every sanctioning body in Australia has had the support of Graham and one of his companies throughout the years. And the sport in Australia wouldn't be what it is without what Graham's done. Now, unfortunately, Graham couldn't be here tonight, but we have put together this video um, that he's done to accept this award. Uh, my name's Graham Cowan, I'm from Sydney, Australia. The highlight of the racing career, well, it's 1967 is when uh, we actually started racing. There's lots and lots of highlights, lots of good memories, lots of friends uh, along the way, um, and lots of good people helped us achieve uh, what we wanted to do. If you fail, you're going to go back to where you were before you started, and it wasn't a place you wanted to be. That's about it. And um, just like to say a big thanks to everybody and the people who voted me in. And uh, we're just getting warmed up. We haven't started yet. I just want to mention that. Drag racing is a family sport, but in this case, our family extends all over the world. And our Australian brothers and sisters, they're having sold out crowds down there as well. Drag racing is as healthy as ever down under. So congratulations to Graham Cowan. And thank you, everybody watching on the stream out there from all around the world. Thank you for your love of drag racing. We'll be back with more from the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame Induction Ceremony. Coming up, the moment you've all been waiting for. 16-time NHRA champion John Force goes into the hall. But coming up next, Sonny Messner gets his moment. A giant thank you to more of our sponsors, including Pat and Jerry Baltus. Pat and Jerry have been great supporters of the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame since 1993. We lost Jerry last year, but thank you, Pat. Thank you, Jerry. We appreciate your support. Greg Sharp has been a sponsor since 2015. Thank you, Greg, for your support of the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. Thank you for making this event as great as it can be. And WFO Radio, that's me, guys. My podcast, been doing it for over 10 years. I am honored and humbled that I get to join this group the least I could do is help out and sponsor. Shout out to the WFO table out there. Thank you all for joining us here at the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame Induction Ceremony. Improve the look of your car with Lightspeed Racing Wheels. Forged magnesium, aluminum, and carbon fiber, Lightspeed Racing Wheels are stronger, corrosion resistant, and lighter. Improving performance, braking, acceleration, and fuel economy. With almost endless customization options, each wheel is custom made to order. For race or street, get the wheel that perfectly fits your needs. Lightspeed Racing, ultra lightweight wheels. Hey everybody, we're out here in the crowd. Look who I found, it's Shirley Muldowney, the three-time NHRA Top Fuel World Champion, countless other championships. How's it going, Shirley, how are you? Wonderful. You know, we wanted to get you involved, isn't it? Amazing to see all these ladies going into the, into the hall and thinking that you like blazed that trail. I didn't know it was so easy. I wish I was there now. <laughs> we would love to see you in the, the seat of a race car, of course, but getting together with all these folks and just being a part of this event, you come each year, you make the effort to come out here. It just wouldn't be the same without you. Your passion for drag racing is unequaled. Why is it that this sport has just hit you so hard and you've made it your life? Well, it always has from day one. It's the only thing. <laughs> I messed up school, I messed up two marriages, I messed up a lot of direction, 
but I'm still here. And this is, it was the one thing I love. Well, we love you. Drag Racing loves you. Ladies and gentlemen, Shirley Muldowney. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. All right, let's find out who our next inductee is and throw it back to our host, Mr. Big Daddy. For our next inductee, we had to come over here to the Don Garlitz Antique Car Museum. Now, even though it's an antique car museum, there's a lot of drag racing artifacts in here. And this particular car leads us to our next inductee, Sonny Messner. This car is a 1940 Studebaker, and these little cars were very lightweight and really adapted well to be made into a gas cars. They were rounded up and turned into race cars all across the country. So one day, many years ago, Sonny, a great fan of the museum, found one of these cars in California completely intact, and he completely restored this car in his home garage and painted it by himself and gave it to the museum. And we're so proud of this because this is a really a nice artifact to have. But Sonny has been such a help to the museum. I met the man in 1961 at Riverside, California. He was just a young boy, and Swingle and I were there with Swamp Route 1 at the Drag News Invitational. And Sonny says, do you boys need a helping hand? We always needed somebody to help out. In those days, that's where you got your crew, right out of the pits. So Sonny helped us out, and we won that race that day. Well, that car was destroyed in the accident when the, everything went into the canal in 1961 in Savannah, Georgia. And I was going to make a recreation of Swamp Rat 3B. And Sonny found out about it and he said, I would like to pay for that restoration if I could have the car in California with a life estate in it till I die. So Sonny paid the entire bill and we shipped the car to California and he takes it to all the drag racing cackle fests out there and it's like having a representative on the west coast. The cars that he's found for the museum is just, I'll try to name a few. The Piranha, he found that for me. The Yellow Fang, John Bradley's flathead dragster that went 176 miles an hour. The beautiful Crestliner Ford over behind me here in the museum. He found all these cars at the different locations in California. He even found the car, Shirley Muldowney's movie car, over at 20th Century Fox. We sure welcome him into the Hall of Fame, and it's such a shame that he can't be here. He's real sick right now, so we need to keep him in our prayers. He's such a nice guy. So please welcome Sonny Messner into the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. Thank you, thank you very much. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. See a lot, so many of my dear friends are out there. And uh, I was just over to Hall of Fame induction for the Motorsports Hall of Fame Tuesday night in Daytona. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, everybody's got silver hair. <laughs> and like I told them, it was a pleasure to be anywhere at my age. So I'd like to say a couple of words about the museum and the Hall of Fame before I get into Mr. Messner. You know, we're, we're be celebrating 47 year birthday for the museum this fall. And this, this Hall of Fame is 33 years old. And I like to say that when my wife and I started both of these ventures, all of our friends says, don't do it. Museums don't make money, and Hall of Fames don't last. And I always said, we didn't do it for the money, we did it for the love. We love the sport, and I love these banquets, I love seeing all these people. And I want to give a special thanks at this point. There's a couple of the inductees that made a great effort to be here, and I appreciate that and all of the fans appreciate it. We love seeing these people that made so many contributions. And uh, I was taking a real good look at the monument the other day, 
And do you know that the initial five or six Hall of Fame banquets, almost everybody on the monument has a black star. And I'm going to tell you, it's really sad to see that. The only good side of it is we know they're in a better place, and that's what's important. Anyway, we're going to keep doing it. it um, the museum is very stable, financially stable. It'll be here for a long time. We could withstand a very serious downturn in the economy, and we would not be affected. So feel confident that the finances have been run properly. It is a nonprofit organization, and uh, there will be no auctions when I die. And uh, my family is on the board of directors, and they all love drag racing. And the outsiders that are on love it too, and they know the importance of preserving the history. So um, we'll be fine no matter what happens to the economy. Now, of course, if we have a nuclear attack, that's different. <laughs> and, uh, but I can, uh, I can stand up here in front of you, and I can tell you straight out there will be no nuclear attack. <laughs> no nuclear bombs will be sent with ballistic missiles anywhere. Trust me. They might use a tactical nuke in the field, they will never shoot a nuclear weapon into space and land back. I know that for a fact. <laughs> and I won't say any more about it, but just rest easy, sleep, night, sleep at night. There's no nuclear bombs going to fall on America or Russia. Okay, Sonny Messner. This is one of the unsung heroes of drag racing. This is a man that gave his entire life to drag racing. Not for money. He had, at one time, he had a lot of money. He lost it all in a real estate venture, and it, he put him into just one little cabin on a piece of property in the desert in California where he lives. One time, he was very, very rich, but a real estate deal went bad in California, and he was part of it. But he, I can't, I, I bet there's not hardly anybody in this room that knows who he is. Anybody knows who Sonny Mestre is? Raise your hand. I see a few hands. Well, I'm going to tell you. At 15 years of age, he worked for Junior Thompson. Now, you know who Junior Thompson is, right? I see some hands. Anyway, Junior Thompson was a guest. He was a big, guy, big a guest guy in California, and Sonny worked for him. But I met Sonny in 1961. Swingle and I had Swamp Rat Three at Riverside, California, for the Drag News Invitational, and that was just me and Swingle. That's all it was. And we would go to the track, and we would gather up somebody to help us. And Sonny was there, just a young boy, and he said he wanted to help, so he was part of the team. We won the race, and that hooked Sonny. He traveled all over the United States with, to, and would meet me. He'd fly on his own nickel and meet me at St. Louis. And he, he would spend the winters with us to race down at the Florida, all of Florida winter events and work on the car. He owned a home, a real nice home in Santa Ana, and we would park the trailer right in front of the house and unload and the parts all in the grass and the street have a whole street blocked off and stay there for weeks and the neighbors never complain nobody complained nothing this is a real upscale neighborhood and um, that went on for years and years he, then junior thompson crashed his a gas car and sonny found a complete car in the desert that was completely rust free and sandblasted by the desert. A lot of cars have been found that way. In fact, that's where he got the Studebaker that you see in the picture. He built that for the museum, no charge, and just gave it to us because he said, 
most of those cars had been destroyed drag racing and one should be restored for posterity and here was a nice one and it's there for the young people to enjoy and anyway he built a complete replica of junior thompson's car running replica right down to every nut and bolt and gave it to junior thompson then when we formed the museum he went to work finding cars here's a few we would send him to auctions with a certain amount of money, not to bid more than that. He was at the Big Harris auction in Reno and bid on the Yellow Fang and the Piranha, two very important cars. We didn't get them. We were outbid by a guy in Chicago. Sonny kept up with those cars where they went year after year. And one day he called me, he says, you need to go to Nags Head, North Carolina. I think you can get the Yellow Fang. And I went to North Carolina and bought the Yellow Fang for $10,000. That car is priceless. It's the only real race car that Big Daddy Ed Roth, my personal friend, ever built. And the only reason it wasn't a championship car, they didn't have a good motor. If they'd had a good motor, they'd have been a killer. Then the Piranha. The Piranha was up in Northern California, and the guy that owned it died. And Sonny said, I found the Piranha. We went up and got it. He had it stored at his house for years, and we brought it back finally to the museum and restored it. We have it just like it was when AMT campaigned it as a top fuel dragster. Rear engine, strange body, I mean, these are the kind of things we love for the museum, not just the everyday stuff. All these things that people did back when you did it any way you wanted to do it. He found the, he was instrumental in me getting the Shirley Muldowney car out of 20th Century Fox. He helped me go over and get it. We, he did all the work tying it on the top of my trailer. That's when we didn't have the great big trucks and got it back to Florida. That real beautiful 1950 Ford Crestliner that's in the museum, an old lady had that in California. He found that for me. Got it, drove it to Denver, and then my wife and I drove it home from Denver. John Weeby's last slingshot, he found that for me. Negotiated the deal, stored it at his house until we could move it to Florida. And the parts that he found, just unbelievable. John Bradley's world record holding flathead dragster 176 miles an hour with a flathead we just had to have that car we didn't know where it was Sonny found it gathered it up took it to his house the pieces saved it for a year or so and we brought it back right now as we speak he has a 1954 Ford the first Ford with the overhead valve engine with the see-through hood they made 107 of them they were not supposed to sell any of them. Two of them got away. Sonny found the one. It was in California. An old lady had it. She bought it when she was a young woman. Somehow she got it out of the dealer. They were not supposed to sell them with those see-through hoods. They were just for in the showroom in 1954. There was a light in the engine compartment, and the hood was down, but you could look in and see the new overhead valve engine. 17,000 miles on this car, never been touched. Sonny got it for $25,000 for it. And the other one I saw in an ad in Hemming sold for 65,000. It just goes on and on. Anyway, a number of years ago, I decided I was gonna recreate the Swamp Rat 3B, as in boy, that won the Riverside race. And I was gathering these parts up because there's a lot of strange stuff on those early cars. Sonny found out about it. He said, I would like to pay for that entire restoration if you'll let me have the car till I die. And then I'll take it to Cackle Fest in California and represent the museum. He paid the entire bill. The car is in his hands. He keeps it just immaculate, maintenance it, 
goes all out to those cackle fests. Steve Gibbs can tell you, he goes to every one of them, no charge, represents the museum. He's real sick right now, and he couldn't come back. And, uh, but I just was notified just before I came up here that there's a video going to play of him accepting. I didn't even know we got it. But he is really a special guy, and we should all hold him up in our prayers that he gets better and he can get back to doing what he loves to do, and that's promoting drag racing and going to those cackle fests in California. He just loves it. It's a, it's a, it's a hit of his life, and uh, I just love him, and I'm so happy that he's been put in the Hall of Fame to be recognized. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Sonny Messner. I live in Acton, California. Uh, I've been uh, inducted into the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. And I want to thank Don Garlitz, Steve Gibbs, Ted Jones, Craig Sharp, Harry Hibbler. I want to thank all these guys for uh, appointing me to this position. It was, it's a very honor to do it. I've been drag racing since 19... 57. I uh, there was no funny cars when I started drag racing, and I recreated, or actually created the uh, 41 Studebaker that Junior Thompson ran, and then uh, not long after that, we, when the Willys began to become popular, we built the Willys, and I built that Willys too. And I've been drag racing ever since, and I met Don Garlitz in '61, and that changed my life forever. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for all the stuff that they've done, especially Steve Gibbs. Thank you. Sonny Messner going into the hall. Big Daddy, great job. Thank you so much. More to come from the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. We'll be back after this. Coming up next here at the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame induction ceremony, this place is gonna go crazy as Vinny and Richard Knapp of Englishtown, New Jersey fame go into the hall. And speaking of great racetracks and facilities, a huge thanks to one of our great sponsors, Summit Motorsports Park. Since 2016, Summit Motorsports Park and the Bader family have supported the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. We appreciate you, we thank you, thank you for your support. And Donovan, since 2004, one of the sponsors for the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. Such a rich history in drag racing. We thank you, we appreciate you, thank you for your support. More to come from the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. When your next adventure is calling, be ready with Gobi Roof Racks. Fully customizable and handmade in the USA. Gobi Racks define what a utility rack should not only look like, but also how it should perform. Created with the adventurer in mind, Gobi Racks will easily carry your most demanding cargo for the life of your vehicle, and it will look great doing it. All seasons, all adventures. Start your dream today with Gobi Roof Racks. We are rolling along, having a great time. More to come, of course. I want to thank the folks at Stewart Cycles. They've been on board for several years, and they are back on board in 2023. Thanks to the folks out there. Appreciate your support of the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. Thank you so much, Stewart Cycles. We're moving out. This is good stuff, just like drag racers moving quick. Let's hit the next video with Big Daddy. Coming up next here at the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame induction ceremony, this place is gonna go crazy as Vinny and Richard Knapp of Englishtown, New Jersey fame go into the hall. The uh, Vinny and Richard Knapp is the junior dragster. Of course, there's Englishtown, which is a whole nother story. But they are the ones who actually perfected the junior dragster and made a class out of them. A lot of people built junior dragsters. Uh, I have one here that the family built their children. This is one Mickey Thompson built. I have one that I built. 
But the Knapp brothers actually created the class for the cars that became the National Junior Dragster. And we have some of those here in the museum too. But from my heart, it's the English town drag strip that I love the Knapp brothers for. They purchased over 300 acres in Old Bridge Township way back in the 60s. By 1965, they were open and running and having great races at that English town drag strip. In 1968, NHRA awarded them the Spring Nationals. That was their first big national event. I remember it well. I won the race. And then in 1973, they got the Summer Nationals, and that stayed with them until they closed the track. And that was really a big blow for drag racing. They lost the English Town track because the English Town track, a lot of people don't know this, but it took the number one spot away from the U.S. Nationals for the most spectators at one point in drag racing and was only finally overwhelmed by the Gainesville track, which finally became number one. But English Town will always be remembered for having such great racing services and such great people promoting it. It was a family that was truly dedicated to drag racing right from the core. But please welcome Vinny and Richard Knapp into the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. Here's Lewis Bloom to make the presentation. I think Big Daddy already did my speech. <laughs> you hit all the highlights, Don. It's great to be here on behalf of the Knapp family, and I'm talking about two people, so it's going to be a little bit longer than normal, so please bear with me. So why are Richard and Vincent Knapp members of this year's Hall of Fame induction ceremony, the class of 2023? Well, the answer is simple. They started and owned one of the most kick-ass drag strips ever built. Simple fact. When you look at the history of drag racing, California had Lyons, Orange County, and Irwindale. Raceway Park, or it is commonly known as English Town or E-Town, was certainly on par with those legendary West Coast tracks. All due to the tireless devotion of the Knapp brothers, their devotion to their business and the sport of drag racing. The Knapp brothers, like so many of their generation, were car guys. They liked to race their hot rods. Richard, a 55 Thunderbird, and Vinnie Knapp, a 32 Ford. They loved working on their cars as much as they liked racing them, and they worked on their cars, hot rods, and in Vinnie's case, Wizard Bicycles, right up until their passing in 2000 and 2001. What they saw at other local tracks in New Jersey inspired them that they could do it better create a facility like none other in the Garden State or even on the East Coast. Another side of the story of the creation of Raceway Park from Richie Knapp Jr. who's standing right there, and his brother Michael is that their dad was watching the Winter Nationals in 1963 on TV and said to his wife Mary, the boy's mom, hey, look at that crowd. That would be a good business to get into. And Mary responded, call your dad right now with that, the Knapp brothers began their journey. Their dad, Vincent Sr., had offered them a chance to start a business. He and his brother, Louis, Uncle Louie, would provide the capital. So on November 25th, 1963, according to the deed for the property, the Knapp family purchased over 300 acres, as Don Garlett said in his little video there, of Jersey farmland in central Jersey for just $300 per acre. Looking back on that, it was a big risk, but what an investment. Some perspective. At the time, for people of New York, Southern Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, North Jersey, going to Central Jersey, Middlesex, Monmouth County, was like going to the moon. That would be the key success to Raceway Park, its location not far from New York City. Construction began and continued up until opening day. The Knapps did most of the work themselves, the construction on their own, with the help of employees from Vincent Sr.'s former company, Knapp Greco Construction. On June 14, 1965, NHRA issued a press release about the sanctioning of a new drag strip in New Jersey called Madison Township Raceway Park. 
According to the release, the new plan sports the latest and modern features and conveniences to both spectators and competitors. It goes on to mention seating for 300 or 3,000 spectators, a super traction asphalt surface, paved return roads, modern restroom facilities, cron deck timers, and a two-story timing tower with air conditioning. I guess that was a big deal back then. The best part of the release, no soggy water-soaked hot dogs or dried up hamburgers, as each food stand had a charcoal grill pit. Special thanks to Bob Fry for that information. I appreciate that, Bob. The track finally opened on July 4th, 1965, and like so many drag strips, the early years were tough. That day, just 172 drivers competed. They bought tech cards, and according to Michael Knapp, his dad said it took all day to run them. Raceway car, excuse me, Raceway Park, I have a runny nose, it's terrible, I'm sorry. Huh? Alan, well, I'm in Germany, so, you know, I'm not used to the weather here anymore. Raceway Park quickly became a regular stop on the tour for barnstorming drag racers of the day, from Timmy Tavi Ivo to Danny Dick Landy, you name it. They all raced at E-Town. In 1966, Raceway Park held its first NHRA points race, a divisional, as Big Daddy said, 1968, they held a national event, which Big Daddy did win, in the form of the Spring Nationals. The track was on its way to being not only a premier facility on the East Coast, but a profitable one. In 1971, the tour returned to Central Jersey for the first of many legendary Summer Nationals races. The event grew into one of the majors on tour. The weather was hot and humid, and the fans loved it. The race featured night qualifying sessions on both Friday and Saturday, ones that often provided record-setting runs. What made the event special was the vocal Raceway Park fans who never shied away from voicing their opinion during the weekend. The race also had many iconic moments. You saw the photo of the Jungle Gym wheel stand, his win in 75, to Big Daddy's blowover, to Kurt Johnson's first ever six second run for a 500 inch car in pro stock. Vinny and Richard enjoyed the success of their labor, especially in the 1970s, thanks to a full schedule of events and excellent car counts every time they opened the gates. There was nonstop action at Raceway Park. By the end of the decade, the Knapp brothers were very successful and living the good life. The only drawback about being only one hour from one of the largest cities in the world was something called suburban sprawl. Land developers were now turning farmland near the racetrack into housing developments, and with that came complaints about the noise coming from the drag strip. Eventually, the Knapp brothers agreed to build a wall around the track and race according to a strict noise curfew. Anything else? Like anything else, the Knapps made adjustments. That would be the start of the 1980s. The track took on a new direction, less noise, more creative events, like the swap meet, which obviously created no noise for the neighbors. There was one driver, Vinny never missed booking for an event in the late 70s through the early 2000s, and that was John Force. He would be Vinny's replacement for the late Jungle Jim Liberman. Vinny needed a new star, someone who had personality and could entertain the track's rabid fans with long, smoky burnouts and wild runs down the quarter mile. John would be that guy. Vinny would support John way before his breakout seasons in the NHRA with not only match race dates, but also financial assistance during the long winter season. A famous story about their dealings involves Vinny working in a trench putting together some pipes. Force wanted to, you know, talk about money. You know, John, John never did that before, talk about money, but he did. He wanted a raise. Vinny responded, put in those rubber cement boots and get your ass in here and we'll work it out afterwards. Force jumped in the trench. The rest is history. Deals were made. The Naps in the early 90s would also build a new timing tower that included hospitality suites in an effort to retain its super track status. The tower, according to Kenny Landon, was built by Vinny and Richard, along with just a few workers. They also replaced the wood bleachers with all new aluminum grandstands, creating a stadium-like effect. New track lighting was the last of the upgrades. Vinny Purchase used 100-foot light poles from the Florida Turnpike Authority. 
He went to Florida and had them truck back to New Jersey, accumulating countless tickets along the way. Like most NAP projects, the family installed the light poles themselves. Racing in the 90s featured some new trends. Vinny was always trying to be one step ahead, what's the next wave? The spring of 1990 featured the E-Town debut of a new exciting class called Pro Modified under the banner of the United States Super Circuit. It was the debut of a class that in some ways replaced the funny cars of the match race days, which became too expensive at that point. In 1992, another event drew national media attention, and that was the Mustang 5.0 versus the Buick Grand National Showdowns. As Mike Knapp would say, we did some cool stuff, and Raceway Park did. Trends toward new events would continue in the 1990s with import races, lifestyle events, along with traditional lace, races, excuse me, like the Nationals, the Truck Race, and the Night of Frills, which typically featured Shirley Muldowney, Robosaurus, monster trucks, and jet cars. The next generation of the Naps would start to work at Raceway Park on a regular basis. Vinny's sons Alex, David and Ryan, Richard's son Richie Jr., Michael, Jimmy, Robert, and daughter Laura. Now Vinny's sons Drew and Ken are here tonight, this evening, they're sitting over there. They're clones of their dad. Unfortunately for them, they never did see their father work on his element at his beloved racetrack, and they really missed out something. Vinny would pass away from cancer in 2000, and his brother would follow a year later in 2001, also from that dreaded disease, a huge loss for their families and the drag racing community. Ultimately, Raceway Park was more than just a drag strip. Actually, later on, there was two drag strips on site. To pay the bills in an ever-changing environment, the Knapp brothers used their property to the fullest, from concert venue to airport, from motocross track to road course, you name it, they did it. Demo derbies, everything, the van in. The Knapps tried to make money and keep the place going any way they could. So let's talk about Richard Knapp Sr., Richard Napoliello, Mr. Richard as charming as they come. He had a world-class smile. His job at Raceway Park was infrastructure, maintaining the property and designing the many future projects that were to be built. His baby was also the airport, which would become a great source of revenue for the Knapp family. Richard was the guy in the office early during the week to make sure the work was done and done right. He would even drive the sweeper truck at the Nationals to make sure the track was in tip-top shape. When Vinny was called to serve in the Military National Guard, Richard took over the entire facility, and one of Richard's mottos in life was, if you want it done right, you have to do it yourself. The Knapp brothers did almost everything themselves when it came to Raceway Park, considering the fact that Richard, later on in life, because of cancer, had limited mobility, what he did at the racetrack was simply amazing. Now let's talk about Vincent Knapp. Vincent Knapp, Vincent Napoliello now, is it Vincent Knapp Jr. or Vincent Knapp II? There's a little debate going on over there. Dave, see, Alex says Jr., Dave says uh, the second. So Vinny was the man who took care of booking the shows at Raceway Park at the track. He was the entertainment guy, just like P.T. Barnum. He did the media buy for the racetrack and helped create the commercials to attract the fans, including the now infamous Hope I can do this, the radio ad, ha ha ha, Raceway Park, and then the music would come in Sunday, Sunday. You've all heard it, right? That was Vinny's idea. He was tough but fair and expected a lot from his racers and employees. He was the one guy who paid you at the end of the race, and if you didn't perform in the racetrack, you knew it. Failure, especially early on, was not an option for Vinny. He believed in himself strongly, according to son Alex. Vinny was also extremely intelligent, an engineering genius, and a master fabricator. Vinny's legacy also includes the creation of the junior dragster. His son Dave recently said he gave drag racing a future. Where would the sport be without that invention? Vinny thought of the junior drag racing league concept while in New York University Hospital fighting lymphoma cancer. According to nephew Michael, Vinny had his unique way of solving problems. It was one of his best attributes. He made solutions simple and quick. One final note about Vinny, he told, he told uh, Wayne Paul, Paul Belly, who worked at Raceway Park for years, he loved to pave. Paul said, 
what do you want to pave? He goes, I want to pave the entire state of New Jersey. That was Vinny's thing, paving. Who knew? Bold Richard and Vinny had help early on from their dad, Vincent Sr., and then their uncle, Louis Knapp. Besides them, their uncle and aunt Marion and also Dean worked in the refreshment stand. So it was really a family effort at Raceway Park. Others along the way who made Raceway Park happen include Mrs. Becker, Berserko Bobby Doerr, a lot of you folks know him, Vince Mealy, Tom Resca, the longtime starter, Michelle Marchese, Paul Bailey, Ken Landerman who's here tonight. Just a few of the names who gave Raceway Park its soul. Champions called Raceway Park their home track. Frank Manzo, Peter and Sal Biondo, Eddie Krawick, who by the way was also a track manager, and Frank Aragona Jr., just a few of the stars of the sport who came out of Raceway Park, and some of the best bracket racers also came out of Raceway Park, guys like Jim Harrington and current winners like Steve Sisko. Also, Richard Knapp Jr., right over there, has got a great Instagram account. It's at Rich Knapp, which features the photos, the history of Raceway Park, some unseen videos, and I'd like to recognize some of the photographers who worked at Raceway Park all those years, Marcel Studios, Vince Mealy, Norman Blake, Steve Bell, Matty Polito, and of course, track photographer John McCartney. So check it out, at Rich Knapp. So what is the legacy of Raceway Park and the two Knapp brothers? When you really think about it, a drag strip is just concrete and asphalt, that is it. But what really matters is how they exposed drag racing to thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. People who became racers, lifelong racers, people who made lifelong friends like I did. That's what it's all about when it comes to Raceway Park, and that's why the Knapp family are being inducted into the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. It is a great honor to welcome my bosses, my former bosses, Vincent and Richard Knapp into the Drag Racing Hall of Fame, accepting on behalf of the Knapp family is Junior Dragster Dave and Richie Knapp Jr. I just want to say, being in this room with the dignitaries and so many racers and, and people that work in our industry that I admire tremendously is the honor of my family's, in, at least in my opinion of our lives. Sorry, that speech really got to me. <clears throat> I would like to begin thanking the induction committee. Steve Gibbs, uh, you went above and beyond. Shirley and John Force, who, um, along with Bunny, I don't even want, that one got me too, but um, the racers, the racers that came through our gates and I can't thank them enough all from, for all of you for, for doing that for us. Um, I also want to thank the induction committee for acknowledging track operators. This is a business where um, if there's no tracks, there's no racing. And we've been learning that in the last few years, so this acknowledgement is, is, is very meaningful. I want to thank Louis Bloom for traveling from Germany <laughs> to be here. Um, um, I'd like to thank the NHRA and congratulate the fellow inductees. My father created the Junior Drag Racing League in 1992, and I don't believe he ever had a dream that it would become something that will ensure the future of our beautiful sport. But that would not have been possible without his brother and the staff of Raceway Park. Our staff is a family of staff. They are the backbone of our business, excuse me. For 53 years, we experienced the fierce loyalty of drag racers. There's nothing like our community. We're there for each other. So I have been privileged in this life to have two families. I have my family and I have my racing family. And anybody in this room knows once you build a racing family, it's for life. 
On behalf of my brothers, I would like to just say to the spectators that drove through our gates and the many racers who sped through our finish line, we thank you for your support and I thank you on behalf of my family for this tremendous honor and always, ha ha ha, Raceway Park. Good evening, everybody. I'm the oldest son of Richard Knapp. It is an honor to speak here tonight, and I guess you guys can imagine what it must be like for a son to be able to talk about his father, especially at this kind of event. I heard a quote once, perseverance is a long, not a long race. It is many short races, one after another, in our case, one quarter mile at a time. I'd like to share a story about perseverance. And it's, as Lewis mentioned, $300 an acre. Well, that was a good one because the story that I have to tell is that the property at Raceway Park when they purchased this was very, very wet. The bulldozers kept getting stuck over and over again. And my father told me about this story about my grandfather on a bulldozer in a suit and tie, very unusual. It got stuck completely over the tracks, down to where I've heard stories about them just leaving him there. My father drove two days to western Pennsylvania to get 2,000 feet of cable and a pulley system. With only two bulldozers and a grader, they couldn't afford to buy another machine. So. They wrapped this cable around a series of pulleys and with the grader as a dead man, the other bulldozer on dry ground, they pulled this bulldozer out. That is perseverance. Maybe I got a little ahead of myself. When my grandfather was stuck in this mud, he cried. He was crying. My father somehow wandered through this mud and got up on the bulldozer and put his arm around him and said, Dad, what's wrong? And he said, we're snake bit. We're never going to make it. I've lost everything. My dad said, don't worry. We're going to figure this out. That's, pers that's perseverance. My father came up with a great idea, a brilliant idea, is that they waited for the winter for the ground to freeze and they pushed these big three feet of frost soil into swales, aiming the swales off the land. When the spring came, those big giant chunks of ice melted and the water ran off the land. It gave them an opportunity to not take the chance to lose any more bulldozers. <laughs> that, was a, that was a sign of relief. When they, when they finished this amazing adventure, they opened the gates, 4th of July, 1965. As the story goes, not many people came. My grandfather, once again, was a little upset. He said, I've lost everything. We're never going to make it. So my father came up with another idea. Along with his brother, Vinny, they went to California, to Southern California. And it was on a Disney trip with me and my brothers. And after they were done with their family duties at Disneyland, they ventured off into Southern California to look at some drag strips. They knocked on the door of a trailer at an old abandoned drag strip. The old man came out of the trailer and he said, do you mind if we walk around and take a look at your place? They walked around, they took a look at the place. And when they were done, he asked the man, how do you advertise? How do you advertise this? He says, well, I want you to listen to something. And he had a tape. That was the Raceway Park Laugh. Amazing tape that I still have. It was too long to be able to add content to it, so they sped it up to make the iconic Raceway Park commercial. With this new commercial in hand, they came back to Englishtown and they hired some big name racers, Dick Landy, Pacers, many, many others. 
On August 15th, 1965, 3,000 people came. That was a pretty good day. My grandfather was very happy. Uh, you know, they were working out of the trunk of the car, no ticket booths, filling the trunk with money. My grandfather was needless to say happy. The sad part about this is that only four years after the drag strip opened, my grandfather passed away. He knew when he was done that his two sons were going to be okay. And my father told me a story about what my grandfather said before he died. He says, as long as you get out of bed and go to work every day, you'll be fine. When my father passed away, he told me the same thing. I still do it to this day. And once again, you can just imagine how it would be for me to talk about my father. It's an honor and a privilege. And I have to thank you know, Don Garlitz, the Drag Racing Hall of Fame, and all those that are involved with this amazing event. The stories about what they contributed is a list that's way too long, but there's many. So with that, I would like to say thank you very much, and I appreciate this time. Next up here at the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame induction ceremony, we're going to keep it Jersey as Bob Fry enters the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. And of course, we'd like to take this time to thank our sponsors, TAC Enterprises, who has been on board since 2002. Thank you, TAC. We appreciate you guys. And Joe Amato Properties, also since 2002, over 20 years of support. TAC Enterprises, Joe Amato, thank you for what you do. We'll be back from the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Improve the look of your car with light speed racing wheels. Forged magnesium, aluminum, and carbon fiber, light speed racing wheels are stronger, corrosion resistant, and lighter. Improving performance, braking, acceleration, and fuel economy. With almost endless customization options, each wheel is custom made to order. For race or street, get the wheel that perfectly fits your needs. Light speed racing, ultra lightweight wheels. Right, we're out here in the crowd. We're getting down to it, almost there. We have a communication from across the pond. We were shouting out to our Australian brothers and sisters. I gotta tell you, we just got one from the British Drag Racing Hall of Fame. Get this, on behalf of the British Drag Racing Hall of Fame and the Stu Bradbury family, congratulations are wished to all of the 2023 inductees and award winners tonight. And y'all have a great night, courtesy of Bev Bradbury. Thank you so much, and look who we found. We had Justin Ashley in the crowd. The International Drag Racing Hall of Fame is not only about the past, but about the present and the future. How motivating is it to you, Justin, to see these drivers go into the Hall of Fame? It's very motivating. And to be honest with you, Joe, it's, it's an honor really to be here. There's so many individuals who have accomplished so much, and, and the sport has so much history. So uh, it's definitely motivating when we see all these people that have made so many contributions get up there and, and talk about how meaningful the sport is. And and how much it means to them. Can't wait to see you on track this weekend. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, let's go to our next video with Big Daddy. Who's next going into the hall? The Founders Award is an award that we give to an individual each year, somebody that probably would never get into the Hall of Fame, someone that we feel has really done a tremendous job for drag racing, but we never see their name even on the nomination list. This year, that person is Bob Fry. He was the announcer for the NHRA races for years and years, the official guy. 
He also emceed our banquet for many, many years. But a little known thing about Bob Fry is he is also an avid collector of drag racing artifacts. And for years, we never had to pay him because he would come here to the museum and he'd walk through the place and he'd look at little different things, real things, like this cow right here. This is the original cow off of Swamp Rat 14, the first rear engine car that won a championship race. And this was on the car at the first couple of events that it appeared at, and also all the testing that was done. Bob wanted this so bad, but we just wouldn't let him have it. But we did give him an awful lot of pieces out of this museum to MC our Hall of Fame. I'm going to have to go up to New Jersey sometime and take a look at this place because I like museums and I like Bob Fry. He's such a likable guy and he put so much color into the banquet. He always had funny little stories to tell. He just kept people on the edge of their seats and we truly believed that he should have the Founders Award this year. So please welcome Bob Fry into the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. And here's Rick Green to make the presentation. I'm sorry I couldn't attend tonight. Congratulations to all the Hall of Fame inductees this year. A special shout out to Linda Jones for being honored with the Pat Garlitz Award. Well deserved. Bob Fry, announcer, statistician, and drag racing historian. Above all of his professional accomplishments, it's Bob's commitment to his family that makes him the man he is. His lovely wife, Diana, and three daughters, Julie, Denise, and Janice. He also has six grandchildren, all boys, after raising three girls. Bob has an unmatched passion for the sport of drag racing. You all know what he is a great announcer, but did you know that he has a love of the history of drag racing? He has an extensive library of books and magazines, a full collection of National Dragster, Drag News, Carcraft, and Hot Rod magazines from the era to mention a few. A lot of those articles he has cataloged. He may even have an article or two cataloged about the inductees tonight. As he was wanting to improve his announcing skills, he began doing statistics. He assembled a library of stats unmatched. He has driver stats for all of the NHRA Camping World Drag Racing Series, Lucas Oil Drag Racing Series Top Alcohol Funny Car, Top Alcohol Dragster, the Pro Mod Series, and the Factory Stock Showdown Series. He also has big databases, as we call them, of each for each category with all the races and the race results in them. He also has some files about number one qualifiers and all the winners and runner-ups from all the national events. Those are just to mention a few of the stats in his library. Now, what we know and love about Bob is announcing. He started announcing in 1996 at Atco Dragway. He has announced for NHRA, IHRA, AHRA, and did you know he once announced drag races for NASCAR? Yes, that NASCAR. He started announcing full-time for NHRA in 1990 until he retired in 2012. In all those years, he only missed one race, the 1992 Maple Grove event, which was at one of his two home tracks to go to England for the NHRA Today Show. He was an NHRA ambassador visiting many member tracks to do special spotlight shows for them. This were, these were big deals for the NHRA tracks. I truly believe it was the race in Phoenix in 1992 that Bob came into his own. The way he handled all the record setting events that weekend was unbelievable. Finally, because of his passion for the sport, he was always made himself available to do charity work, emceeing special events. This was the fun part for me because Bob would ask me, he w ask if I wanted to attend. At first, I thought Bob really liked me, but then I figured out he just wanted a driver. He really didn't like driving after dark due to the incident in Dallas. Bob would always emcee the big draw auction 
Well, there had been a rain delay that day, and so the racing and the auction ended at the same time. Bob was ready to get to his room. He asked one of the Motorplex people if there was a shortcut. They gave him a shortcut to his hotel. He started taking it down the dark farm roads. As he was on his way to the hotel, out of nowhere, a pig appeared. He hit it. There were no houses around. He didn't know what to do. He looked. His car had sustained a little bit of damage, but was drivable. So he went on to his room. Well, from that point on, Bob didn't want to drive after dark. I became his driver. Ask him what happened with the rest of the pig story. When I was telling my mother he was retiring, she told me to tell him he still has to get me into all those cool events that we would attend. So on that note, I guess I'm still riding on his coattails. I am honored to announce the 2023 Founders Award to Bob Fry. That, thank you. Uh, that was Rick Green, by the way, and Rick wanted to be here, but he tripped and fell at home, literally, and cracked two vertebrae in his back and uh, couldn't make it here. Um, so it must be the drugs made him say I first announced in 1996. It was actually 1966. <laughs> but there have been a lot of pictures that have run tonight, and I wanted to thank Richard Shute, by the way, who is here at the table with us tonight. Richard shot a lot of the pictures. Some, some may still pop up. There were a couple that I had to mention. As Rick mentioned, I loved working for the folks who draw, raising money for them. And one year we were at the auction and somebody had bought a silver tiara, like a, a crown for Beauty Queen, and asked if I would wear it on the starting line the next day. And I said, well, if we can get a bid of $5,000, I'll wear the tiara. We got the bid. I wore that on the starting line the next day. And ironically, one of Tony Schumacher's uh, teams had a four-star army general that I had to interview during the pre-race. <laughs> I interviewed him, he kept looking up at the, at the tiara, and I don't know if it was cause and effect, that was in October of that year. In November, the army announced they were canceling sponsorship of the top fuel car. <laughs> I like to think it was a coincidence. <laughs> there was also a, a picture that may pop up yet where I wore a devil dress onto the starting line. At the draw auction, somebody asked if I would wear it. The event, the event was in October. I said, if we can get a bid of $5,000, I'll wear it. They raised $7,500, and the next day I was wearing a devil dress on the starting line at Dallas. The one other time that I raised money for draw, Dave McClellan and I were at Indianapolis. We finished the draw auction, and Dave said, how about a nice round of applause for Bob? Bob would do anything for draw, including give you the shirt off his back. Well, somebody said, I'll give you $1,000 for the shirt. I said, well, keep the bidding going if Dave will take his shirt off too. So Dave and I stripped to the waist, auctioned off these shirts. I came, came home and told my wife, I said, you should have seen it. And she said, let me get this straight. You were naked from the waist up in front of people? I said, yes, I was. She said, that's not a pretty sight. I said, you're supposed to love me. I do you, but believe me, that's not a pretty sight. And I didn't have the heart to tell her that Dave McClellan had just had open heart surgery. He had a scar from his belly button to his, na to his neck, and he still looked better naked than I did. <laughs> so, I, I also want to thank Big Daddy uh, for the honor here tonight. I remember being at ATCO in 1965, when Don ran 200 miles an hour and I was announcing it, my head just exploded. It was great. 60 years later, I talked to Don Garlitz about drag racing, politics, and alien abductions. <laughs> and after every one of those conversations, my head exploded all over again. <laughs> so in 50 years, some things never change. And by the way, I want to tell you people, you're all being part of drag racing history because in the history of the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame, this is the first time the two words, nuclear attack, have ever been used. <laughs> there are over 250 people that are in the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. There are 24 people that have been 
honored with the Founders Award. One of the first to be so honored was Wally Parks. So to be in the same conversation with Wally is something I will cherish forever. The name of the award is the Founders Award. And since Don Garlitz is the founder, to be used in the same sentence as Don Garlitz is something that I'll always cherish. Now, a lot of you noticed when I was out there in the lobby earlier, I'm wearing this little gold pin that at first value, at face value, looks like the Wally Trophy that they give out at the NHRA drag races. Well, if you look closer, the driver is holding a microphone. This little pin was given to me by a sportsman racer 30 years ago, and I cherish it every day. I'm also wearing a championship ring that was designed by Chip Foos, given to me by NHRA and Coca-Cola the year before I retired. I was the only non-driver ever to be presented with a championship ring, and I cherish that every day. But more than the jewelry and the gifts are the friends that I've made in this sport over the years, many of whom are in this room here tonight. And believe me, I cherish your friendship forever. To be able to call legends of the sport my friends is something that I never take for granted, and it's something that means more to me than you will ever know. I have two people to thank, basically, for my journey in the sport of drag racing. One is somebody you've heard of. The other one is somebody you probably never heard of. The one you never heard of is my best childhood friend, Dan McIsaac, who is here with us tonight. Dan and his father took me to my first drag race in 1964. I remember getting out of the car, walking up and seeing the track at Atco Dragway, seeing it was a completely straight line, and I thought, this is going to be boring. <laughs> but after I saw the first two cars go down the track, I was hooked. About two weeks later, Danny and I wanted to go back to the track. My brother Mike, who is here with me tonight, heard us talking about how exciting it was, and Mike said he wanted to go to the drag races with us. Well, this was 1964. We were three unemployed teenagers. It cost five bucks to get in, and that was a lot of money. So we figured the only way that we could do it was if two of us hopped in the trunk and snuck in. So Danny and I, being the two smallest ones, got in the trunk, and we drove in. And everything was going great until Mike got to the gate and the lady taking the ticket said, how many? And Mike said, three. <laughs> Mike never drove again. <laughs> we were going to form a super team, Mike, Danny, and I. So we all took turns driving the car down the track, and I had the worst ET. I figured you can't drive it. We took the car back to the pits. The car was steaming. Danny said, go check the engine. I couldn't find the hood latch to open the hood. <laughs> so I figured you can't work on it. And just then an announcement came over the speaker at ATCO said they were looking for people to audition for a job as an announcer. Mike and Danny looked at each other, looked at me, and said, go. <laughs> and the rest, as they say. The other person I have to thank is Lyndon Baines Johnson, the 36th President of the United States. Now, Don, I know he's a Democrat, so don't rescind the award yet, okay? <laughs> but you see, I volunteered to go into the service in 1965. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I volunteered during the height of the Vietnam War, which just goes to show you, you don't have to be a genius to get an award from Don Garlitz. <laughs> anyway, after basic training, the Air Force asked me where I wanted to go. And of course, being from New Jersey, I wanted to go to California. I wanted to see Lions and Half Moon Bay and Kingdon and all the great tracks out there. And of course, when you asked to go to California in the service, they sent me to New Jersey. <laughs> I got to McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey on January 10th of 1966. I dated my wife, Diana, for the first time on January 22nd of 1966. I announced my first drag race at Atco Dragway in April of 1966. So if the Air Force had sent me anywhere else except back to New Jersey, I wouldn't be here tonight, and you guys might be honoring Alan Reinhardt. <laughs> or not. Oh, by the way, Danny also introduced me to my wife, Diana, and this May we will celebrate our 55th wedding anniversary. And I always thank my wife, Diana, my three wonderful daughters, one of whom is with me here tonight, for their love and support because they made my travels on the road so much better because I knew I'd always come home to their love. And just to show you one of the reasons why I just love Diana so much, 
We were sitting around the house a little while ago. Dinah looked across the table at me and she said, you know, after all these years, you're still cute. <laughs> no, no, wait, that wasn't the joke. And I looked at her and I said, look, that's nice of you to say that, but I realize I'm just a skinny, geeky, bald-headed guy with glasses. And without missing a beat, she said, yep, but you know how hard it is to find all those qualities in one guy? <laughs> I've been blessed over the years to be able to announce for a lot of people in the sport, from John Mulligan to John Forrest, from Bob Moravis to Bob Tasca, from Larry Dixon Sr. to Larry Dixon Jr. And I've enjoyed every minute of it. I've announced on two continents, five countries, been to almost 200 tracks, and enjoyed every minute of it. But being honored here tonight is the best. In front of the legends, the people I admired greatly for everything you do in all facets of the sport, the people who made drag racing what it is, the people I'm proud to call my friends. Yeah, this is the best. I've been asked a lot of times, how are you doing? When I was working, I said, I've got a wife that loves me, kids that are happy, grandkids that are spoiled, and a job that's like stealing money. And now that I retired, I've still got three of them. So it's not bad. When I think back about it, it's been a pretty good career. And it all started in the trunk of a 1965 Plymouth. <laughs> and as I said, when I signed off the microphone at Pomona in 2012, it's great to be Bob Fry. Thank you very much, and I love you all. Coming up next, the 16-time NHRA Funny Car World Champion, John Force, enters the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. And it is all possible because of our sponsors, including Hilton, we appreciate the Hilton, the room has grown, the service is amazing, and we thank you greatly for your support of the Don Garlitz Museum of Drag Racing International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. And of course, John Force Racing. Since 2002, John Force Racing has supported the Hall of Fame inductees, and now he will become one, coming up next. At Eagle Lights, we're off-road and motorsport enthusiasts at heart and one of the largest aftermarket LED headlight manufacturers in the world. Manufacturing the highest quality LED headlights and motorcycle lights possible. At EagleLights.com, you can find the right size lights with the right connectors the first time without guessing. So you can buy and use Eagle Lights with confidence. Eagle Lights, finely crafted LED lighting solutions. See and be seen. John Force, one of my favorites, one of my heroes. What can you say about him? I couldn't even begin to tell you the winnings. I'll just tell you he's won the world championship 16 times, and oh my God, it's all the records. He's still out there racing. But I would just like to tell you that John Force is my hero because he paid his dues. I remember back in the 60s when he was just working on his car just like I would. He would come to the races, his car and one helper. He's in there checking the bearings just like me in the motel parking lots. He didn't have two nickels to rub together, but he was still out there fighting it. And then finally, he got a good crew chief and he was on his way. He has done so much for drag racing, so much publicity, he had his own TV show, should have been in the Hall of Fame years ago, but John didn't want to be in the Hall of Fame so early. He said, my sponsors might think I'm retiring. Oh my God, I don't think he'll ever retire. Anyway, it gives me so much pleasure to welcome him into the Hall of Fame. He belongs in here. He's one of the idols of drag racing. And uh, he was only, he would have been number one if it wasn't for me for the 50 years of drag racing. He finished number two behind me. I just had such a head start on him. That was all it was. And he's such a likable guy, too. He's so good with the fans. He's been so good for drag racing. I mean, I would have to say that I believe that John Force is responsible for the period that the sport is enjoying today. 
the publicity that it gets and the professionalism, John Forrest was one of the leading forces that brought all this to happen. He definitely belongs in the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame. And please welcome my good friend Dave Densmore to make the presentation. Well, all that John has accomplished in the sport uh, is capsulized pretty well in the program. So you can read that if you want to. I'm going to tell you some John Force stories that probably aren't Hall of Fame quality. <laughs> well, when I met John in the 70s, I was working in an HRA, and I could see nothing in anything he did that showed he had a clue about what he was doing. <laughs> but he was very enthusiastic, and he was a heck of a storyteller. And really, my partner in crime at NHRA at the time, Steve Earwood, actually pointed out to me, because John would come in and ask us for tickets before every race. Well, I need tickets. I need six tickets. I need eight tickets. And, he's, and I said, the guy's just a, a mooch. He's just trying to get free tickets. And he said, look at who he's bringing with these tickets. And it was always new people to drag racing, whether it was the people at Leo Stereo or Castro or Wendy's or Mountain Dew, whoever. He was always selling the sport and selling himself as best he could. And finally, I was able to, to, to see what... Actually, when I came to Gainesville in 1979, forces at a Wendy's with the race car, displaying the race car on race day. It was displayed in the morning and took the car to the racetrack then after that. Uh, and not, that was the year he, he got into the show uh, back when NHRA had the break rule and uh, Larry Fullerton couldn't, couldn't race and John raced uh, Tom McEwen first round and got beat. But... Uh, Throughout the years, I finally went to work for him in 1987 when Castro created the super team, and we worked together for 29 years after that. And I used to be much taller. Uh, <laughs> but some of the things that, some of the fun we had, you could just not have that fun today because they would just jail us. And, Probably, probably throw away the key, but um, it, it's 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 a a ride with John that I I wouldn't take take anything for. It was, it was great times. We uh, we won a lot of races, but we had fun even when we weren't winning races. And to to have been a part of that for for so long and to still be associated. To some small degree today, uh, kind of keeps me involved in the sport, and uh, I still love the sport, and I still love John. Uh, you know, everybody, when, when you get to a, a point where you're winning races, everybody has talent. The, the determining factor beyond that is, do you have staying power? And John Forrest has staying power. Before he had his crash in Dallas in 2007, he had won 14 championships in 135, 135 races. 130 races. Then they air flighted him out of the motorplex into the hospital, and there was a race in Richmond like two weeks later. I put out a press release that said John wasn't going to compete in that race, and he was going to fire Elon Werner and I because we didn't know he wasn't going to race. He had two weeks to get well. And it was some of the best times were when he was in the hospital, surprisingly enough, because he, he told us some stories about he was having a conversation. Somebody came into his, his hospital room every night, and he had a long conversation with him, and we, we couldn't figure out who it was. And finally, it was a jack-o'-lantern that I think Ashley put in the room. It was around Halloween. <laughs> So he was high on drugs, and he would talk to the jack-o'-lantern every night and tell us about it. But uh, 
anyway, he, he, re, he recovered. Even though the doctors said he wasn't going to race again, he, he fought through it. He recovered, and we were with him for that, that long journey. And he came back and won 25 more races and two more championships. So uh, when he won last year at Charlotte, that was 34 different seasons he's won at least one NHRA national event. So if, if that's not staying power, I don't know what, what is. So uh, without any more fanfare, the newest uh, inductee into the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame, the man, the myth, the legend, and my good friend, John Force. I think it's time to go home, don't you think? But boy, I heard some real shit tonight. <laughs> I feel so guilty, I, and my mood has changed here 20 times tonight. I, I almost tried to sneak out from the bathroom and go home. Brad Anderson, I want to, your family, what you've done, and all the inductees here that have, have uh, that have, and in the past, and now in the ones in the future, uh, for coming into this Don Gartless, this this house of his, um, I'm excited just to be a part of it. And I heard so many say, "Just the call from Don." I got the call from Don. It it uh, I won't tell him, but I'll tell him now. Made me cry, and other people have said it. Brad, I feel so guilty. That check I wrote you in 78, I'm going to cover. Okay? And Vinny Knapp, I still owe you two grand. I'm going to pay it, I promise. And you know that ain't bullshit. I borrowed from everybody in this room. Grandpa Tasca, you know, I started, when I go back, you, you don't know this about me. And, but in 1966, I snuck my mom's Buick Wildcat. I was a Chevrolet guy from day one, even though I got sidetracked. Grandpa Tasca uh, got me uh, into that other brand. I got to watch Chevrolet's here. I'll get, my, I'll get in trouble. But Ford Motor Company, and we won with them. But I, ran, I won with General Motors and Chevrolet's with those mobiles with Pontiacs. Uh, did a little bit of everything. But I had a great time, but I had great teachers. And Grandpa Tasca was one of them. And I, I've got Hervis uh, and, and, and Frank Teagues and people that are teaching me now, people that have made a lot of money and they're teaching me still and don't give up. It's all about, I'm, I'm going to have to give up. And I feel sorry for Robert Hyde because he's stuck with all this shit. <laughs> okay? But he's been leading the charge for me, and I just, I just uh, really love you for all you do, Robert, and I really do mean that. And he's a great individual. And, but I keep asking myself, why, why did I come? I didn't come to make money or win trophies. I was down there at Lions. I came home, and, and I remember hearing the chainsaw at the trailer house I lived in. Yeah. When you live in a trailer house, you get in the first thing to get away from it, right? And now I'm in the biggest trailer court in the world. It just, it never goes away. And something else here, I'll, I'll get to, and I'll get to this quick. These two things, Garland's Museum, uh, NHRA's National Dragster, they became my Bibles. I, I was growing up as a Bible uh, kid and learning it and I found that Bible that I got in 1958 or something and, and uh, I've been reading after last year's banquet don't read Gibbs I've been reading <laughs> <clears throat> so along this road and I want to be quick I, I, I could spend here an hour uh, you know uh, my, my two 
uh, my, my daughter Courtney, we had empty seats, and I heard a guy back there, some asshole said, hey, nobody wants to set with fours. Uh, Graham, who just finished in the IndyCar race at St. Pete, had the sixth, had to go home with the two little, with uh, Tenley and, and um, Harlan, I know that. <clears throat> Indy car driver shows you he knows his place. But those kids, they, they motivate me. And if, if something, you, don't worry. I saw the guy falling asleep over there. I'll hurry up, Dizzy. But it's funny that you lived through your children, and now I'm living through my grandchildren. And, and, and it's, it's uh, I have days that I wake up, I'm pretty old, and I gotta tell you something. Where you at, Garlitz? Where you at? Garlitz, there ain't no way you're 90 unless there's an alien in that body. <clears throat> because nobody can do the shit you do. And you've been my hero. He, he walked over one time at a racetrack in Tucson, Arizona, when I raced, raced for AHRA. I ran IHRA, and now I'm a NHRA guy, is that sucking up or what? But, uh, but uh, the reason for these magazines and, and Gartlets is I couldn't, uh, oh, and Gartlets, he went over to my injector because we were, we were a joke, and he touched it, and I remember my brother Louie, Bob Fisher, they both lost two wives because they're helping me race, but, and, and it was one of them deals where they all said, he touched our car. <laughs> Don Gartlett's touched our car. And they said, shit, this thing's going to start. <laughs> that's, that's how we lived. Now, I'm not going to get into boring stories how uh, uh, me and Densmore in Rockingham, uh, we drank a little bit too much and rolled over upside down. But I'll never forget... The Bojangles chicken, and we never spilled a drop, did we, Denzi? We, we should have went to jail. But in the middle of it, chicken was all over the roof. And uh, you took a leg and I had a breast, right? That's how we lived. And what was really sad, there was Airwood with his Bible praying for these two salt lost souls is what we were. And if it wasn't for my wife, Lori, I'd still be lost. And I'll get to that in a minute. So what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that somewhere along your life you're depressed and you wake up every day and you got money in the bank, millions. Okay, Garlis, I'll throw in another 10 on the toolboxes. <laughs> Can't believe I said that, Robert. We're going broke and I'm giving away money. But what you're doing here with this museum is unbelievable. You know what I'm saying? And <clears throat> he can't hear me, so I, I could have said 100 million. <laughs> he wouldn't know the difference. <clears throat> but in the middle of this, where was I going, Denzi? <laughs> so in the middle of this, I have these days where I wake up and I'm depressed. I, I got cars that are running. I got the young proc kid. I got Brittany. I got Courtney coming out of retirement, her and Ashley. I'm working on it. Okay. That's what makes me. That's what makes me. But I got to tell you something. Certain things motivate you, and you don't know where you came from. You don't know why. I used to stand. I used to sneak into Orange County Raceway. Wally Parks caught me. Gibbs caught me at Pomona climbing the fence. Jeez. And you... Yeah, my race car's in there, but I gave my tickets to one of the crew guys. But what I'm saying is, why do you live? Why do we do it? About the past, about the present, about the future? Why am I still doing this at my age? Okay? Why, Gartlets? Why? Because we love it, right? And we don't know why. I fell in love with NHRA, and I ain't figured that shit out yet. Okay? <laughs> But in the middle of it, I'm going to close up here. You ain't ever going to have to hear me again. I'm going to run off, okay? But I went out, my grandsons, my, my granddaughter uh, Autumn over there, 
uh, is moving up. She's 17, beautiful, going in to drive hot rods, uh, moving up in drag race. Jacob and Noah, they're going to race. But let me tell you something that happened to me. My son-in-law runs my car, Daniel Hood, and for Breezy. Hey, for Breezy, I gave you a heart attack, huh? See, I don't get them, I give them. But we got that race hot rod back together, didn't we? Uh, they, his wife called me and said, he's in the hospital. I think something's wrong with him. I said, well, I don't know about him, but it's, it's Gainesville. <laughs> get, him, get him up. So anyway, Danny says, we, we, we watch um, uh, hockey, right? That's right. I get that wrong. I just have blank spots. But anyway, we watch hockey. And I'm trying to figure out what makes me tick. My wife says, you're miserable to live with. We've got to get, on, get you on the road. And in the middle of this, by the way, I drive for Peak Chevrolet. They just gave me a three-year contract. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Frank has lined up. Uh, Brittany, her with Monster, and naturally with Flavor Pack and Proc. He's in the seat, okay? Uh, with uh, Montana brand Robert Hyde. You got more, so many sponsors. You got all the Chevrolet bodies ready to run because they're all got different paint jobs on them. But what I was getting to is, Danny said, we got to win this game in the morning. So we went on Sunday and the, the boys lost. And this was a terrible team and they lost to them. Then, then we had to play the big team that night. And they said, these guys are number one in, in hockey. And it's going to be tough, Danny said. But I heard the coach with these little kids, 10 years old, 8 years old, and Jacob and Noah's watching his brother. He plays too. And, in, and they drive hot rods too. But in the middle of this, they went out on that field, and they went nuts on that hockey rink. And I was screaming and yelling, and I walked out of there, and my wife says, oh, my God, what happened to you? Because what I saw, what I felt I was losing, what I saw when you're young, the fire in your belly to win, to be a part of it. You know, I see it in Brittany. I see it in Hart. I see it in Proc. So many of these kids, Robert Height, Hagen, all of them, Wilkerson, Caps, they want to win. Here I am, 100. I'm just trying to stay alive, if you want to know the truth. But in the middle of it, they won. They weren't even going to make the playoffs. And in the middle of it, they took the points lead, and it was like a miracle. But I walked out of there, and my wife said, you have changed in a matter of an hour and a half because I found what I lost, and I lost it, and I couldn't figure it out. That young little person inside of you that makes you chase that dream every day because that's what it's all about. Shelly watching her children out there, that, that's what it's all about. And sometimes we lose it. So when you get old, that shit happens. But get up off that couch. Get off that couch. There's nothing wrong with anybody in this room if you think you're older and you got gray hair. I put shoe polish on my hair to make me look cuter. <laughs> so and somebody actually mentioned that to me. What'd you do to your hair? What I'm saying is I found myself. And there is a God up there. Okay, there is a God up there, Airwood. You've been telling me for a long time. I'm starting to listen. But what if he's an alien? Because <laughs> I listen to Godless, because that's the smartest son bitch I know. <laughs> so look, I want to thank everybody, the Jimmy Prox, the Grubniks, you know, for Breezy, Daniel Hood, when you look at all these kids, uh, uh, Cunningham and, and his partner Barlam and Jimmy Proc, all that they do. So I want to say one thing, and I know if you read this, you'll see everyone that got me here, only a few missing. But I want to say this. To tell you the truth, I forgot what the hell I was going to say. <laughs> okay. What I'm saying is, Bob Fry, I really do love you. 
Rick shoots. The first guy took a picture of me. And I won't ever forget that. I'm going to cover that check too. One of these days. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, my daughter Brittany went on the championship. Courtney, Ashley, all of them being in the, in the, in the hunt every week. But you know what? I can stand up here and get a pat on the back, but the real truth is I'm just an old stupid truck driver. Not the truck drivers are stupid. <laughs> I, oh, I gotta watch, what's that word called in the, the new world we live in? <laughs> Screwed up. <laughs> no, whoa, it was whoa. I don't wanna touch that. But what I'm saying is, is that Along the road, there was so many. Steve Pluger, I mean, the people, unbelievable. Um, Austin Coyle and Bernie Federley. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be standing here because I was a real loser and stupid to know it, but I loved it with a passion. But I'll tell you something else. The woman that I've loved my whole life, Lori, come up here. Come up here right now. Just come here. Come here. Lori, come here. Come here. I want to say to you, because I've failed you, and she's in the Hall of Fame, with Pat, right, Gartlets? And <laughs> you may be laughing, I can't see either. You drivers ought to really fear me. But I want to say this I should have been dead a long time ago. The stupid stuff I've done. And I say she's my, my mother, Teresa. God protects me because of this woman. And I've been a screw-up my whole life. But she stood by me. Been married 42 years now. Like yeah. <laughs> and and um, I love her, Don Gartlets. I just had, got so stupid. Okay, I'm quitting on that. Okay, I want to give my wife this trophy and tell you how much I love you. And I want to say one last thing for me and my wife because we joked about it. Have any of you all been down in Texas? Have you ever heard the song, If You're Ever Down in Austin, by Merle Haggard? And what does he say? He says, Bob Wills is still the king. Well, let me tell you something. Don Garlitz, you are the king. Ladies and gentlemen, John Force. And Dave Densmore. And that is how you have an International Drag Racing Hall of Fame induction ceremony. And that will do it, but I do want to mention one final thing, guys. One final thing out there. I'm just going to go on this. That lithograph we sold earlier, uh, or the original painting we sold earlier, if you really liked it, you can get a lithograph. It is The number is at your table. Part of the literature you have gotten. You can order them online. Don't forget your scotch glasses and your t-shirts and all of that stuff. But now it is time to party. That is right. Look at this.
Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Everybody on Flow Sports Competition Plus, it is time to party. We'll see you at the Emily Motor Oil NHRA Gator Nationals Big Daddy, the honor of my life. Thank you for allowing me to do this. John Force, everybody who was inducted, thank you so much. Have a great night. Don't forget your glasses, your programs, your T-shirts, and we'll see you right here in 2024. Have a great night, everybody.